for having me. It's always a pleasure. It's been interesting doing this and seeing artists and different guests come in with all this different artwork, you know, I've been seeing, but you in particular came in with clothes that you've designed. Yes. Glass that you've blown and yes. have designed yourself. Um, I guess let's get into it. Maybe tell the uh, listeners about yourself and where all this came from and when you got started. It's a uh, <laughs> it's a long story. Um, I guess it started when I was on sabbatical, uh, you'd call it. Um, I was a caregiver for my grandparents for a long time, and uh, after they had passed, I'd gotten to this period where I didn't know what to do and I didn't have a direction at all. And uh, it was, and I guess I'm still kind of in that period a slight bit, but I've gotten a lot more direction and I feel a lot more confident in where I'm going with things. So, um, but uh, <laughs> some of the things I discovered was uh, uh, before that sabbatical was doing the artwork. Um, I started doing artwork just as a way to escape from reality, I suppose. Um, and like creating and making art, I feel, is a much better escape from reality than a lot of drugs and a lot of other things people use for that. Um, and so uh, one of the things I uh, here, let me grab this here, started doing was um, geometric artwork. It's the kind of things you can see on the, uh, the clothing there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for those who are just listening and not watching, he brought in some hoodies and looks like dresses. Yeah, some, some skater kind. dresses here, yeah. some hoodies. With a bunch of really interesting shapes and colors on it. Very vibrant, a lot of detail. But this is um, kind of a collection. It's almost like an unwritten, unpublished book I made of different, like, arts I've done. Um, oh, just wow. from, like, um, a lot of geometric stuff. Um, but, yeah, if you uh, <laughs> like to get your thoughts on things, on any that stick out to you, I'd like to make from the next um, uh, clothing. Because that's where all of this artwork comes from, is the hand-drawn geometric mm -hmm. work. Um, just sitting down with a, a compass and playing with it and um i kind of fell into that reading about philosophy and reading about like old school um the greeks were so into that they were like if you didn't know how to make all these weird geometric designs you weren't that was like the password to get into the club for like hmm. plato's place and everything like that it was like um this kind of um mathematics that hadn't been seen in that area of the world before and that it was so trippy and like next level to them that uh um and it's kind of been lost and it kind of got uh, for me like i was never very much into math or science or any of the things i really needed to make all this stuff so um for me artwork is as much i don't know pushing the boundaries of what i'm capable of as much as like making something pretty um so yeah and it's been a very fun journey like just going from that point to being like you know what, this is really cool, I'd really like to wear this, to being like, how can I do that? And stumbling down that pathway. And uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, I um, I started designing my own websites through, uh, through Squarespace, and that's another thing that I had no knowledge of, I was bad at, <laughs> that I spent time and built... <laughs> many, many versions of websites until I could get them workable and get them, like, functional. And I'm not, I'm designing them, I'm not programming or anything, so it's not even that next level. But um, just put, putting yourself through the effort of something that's frustrating to, like, until it works is, is worth doing. Um, so I've built uh, the Duffy Media Group, or the uh, Max Duffy Glass website. That's kind of like, I'm rebuilding it right now, but uh, I built Duffy Drop, and I found a way to scan these these prints in at a high enough definition to where I can print them and they look good. And um, I'm currently looking for a new local person to, like, if I would love to work with a local printer collective or some kind of, like, if I can give a ream of clothing to someone and they can actually make dresses and stuff out of it, that'd be, like, super ideal. I love to collaborate <laughs> and keep things local. Um, so that's the only thing that um, I'm looking to change as far as the uh the duffy drop like dot com thing goes um is to make them more bespoke but um just as far as like people really seem to like the designs the uh this kush oscillator design here um i've never made a habit of drawing weed leaves but um people seem to really love it and uh uh i made it into um uh <clears throat> 
into uh, shirts and uh, hoodies, and uh, I actually have uh, a lot of bathing suits and stuff right now available, like bikinis and things like that. Um, I am looking for, like I said, more local, but uh, right now it is available, and yeah, I'm going to have a lot more available in person. I'm going to be doing more like events and things like that. Um, yeah, it's been very fun, and uh, <clears throat> I'm looking to expand more and collaborate. I'd love to do more with some artists. I've done a lot with... Um, uh, not as much with logos, but I, I'd love to do different collaborations. I think working between artists is the best way to both ex, like expand um, these individual arts, these individual like design, I guess disciplines, as well as like market your market yourself or like network yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, um, it's been really fun. And that I don't know the um, I was a performer before I was anything. I was very much into music, and music has always been, like, the baseline thing. It's strange I'm not here about music at all. But um, I guess it's because I've taken a step back with it, and I really want to um, perfect it before I put it out there. And we've had a recording session before, and I was going to put that music out. And I went back and listened to it, and I'm like the lyrics and I'm like this isn't me this is I'm like if I had put that out it'd be like flipping tables like no and I feel like I keep needing to go through these iterations to put things out when it comes to that um because it is so personal uh and I feel more obliged to like share all this other art because it's um it is meaningful and it comes from a meaningful place but I don't know it's it's here this is about making beautiful things because they last long and because they're beautiful. It's not because there's any kind of message. There's the message is we've turned dirt and rocks into beautiful things as humans. And that's beautiful to me, um, is making something greater than it was. Um, and that's kind of why I've gotten into glass. I wanted to make art that stays. I wanted to, you know, <coughs> doing an open mic at the gallery cabaret or like, killing it at like a show at like um <laughs> i did a show once uh doing like uh rapping and doing um like hip-hop stuff at uh the the bottom lounge no it was the one beneath um oh, i'm forgetting the name i'm i'm blanking but in, in the uh, city yeah in the city yeah um, subterranean subterranean the one below subterranean yeah the, the lobby area it's and, just yeah i think and it's called pack it downstairs with people, yeah just, when you when you pack it with people and they're all they're really into it it's a very powerful thing you know i know that's very tiny compared to the the grandeur of like being a very popular musician and the, i'm sure the magic gets more much more, much more intense and long lasting but for me that was such a, a great feeling but it was so short-lived it's like when i was performing as a musician it was almost like <laughs> what i imagine people like they talk about smoking crack and it's like all right i had my fix and that's like i need the next one it's mm-hmm. like that's why almost um and i hear it in some of the touring touring musicians that you've interviewed on here like the need to perform it's like even if they were getting minimum wage and you know not making it um and not didn't have the opp- didn't have the hope of going bigger and have and being very comfortable monetarily um the urge to perform is is bone deep you know it's it's the desire to um <clears throat> to bring magic to the room. Mm-hmm. Um, How long have you been playing music for? Fourth grade. <laughs> and what <laughs> instruments do you p- perform? Okay, so confession is my very first instrument I picked. It was the flute. And I didn't know girls were supposed to only play flute. Are they? And it was uh, in, in the fourth grade in 1990, like whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what it was. It was weird. For, uh, Just allegedly. gave me your age. All right, right. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm 30. Most people don't think I'm 30. I, uh... They either think I'm 25. Oh, you said or, fourth grade, 1990. I was yeah. like, wouldn't that make you 40? Mm, I guess it would. I guess <laughs> that's closer to 99 or 2000. I was in there. But okay. I don't, yeah, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I uh, <clears throat> played flute for about a month. Uh, got into drums because that's where you put the kids when they don't know what they want to play. Mm-hmm. Um, and I rode percussion all the way through college um and through that i taught myself guitar um don't use my pinky so i'm not a real guitarist to a certain extent um but i learned piano through like marimba and xylophone i know the keyboard really well when i do play guitar i I translate it to keyboard in my head um i know some musicians do that some just are able to envision the path of scales and stuff on the guitar just by itself Mm -hmm. um but uh yeah it's been really fun and it's it's one of those 
universal languages that transcend um, uh, nationality and like verbal language and music to me is really, I don't know, if there is a thing sacred. Um, so I don't know. It's, uh, it's something I am excited to get back into and excited to start performing again. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, I'm glad I've done this like not publishing anything, not putting it out there. When I used to perform at uh, Lily's and stuff like that, um, Blaze B, there's a lot of those really talented local MCs and stuff. If, if you look into the local Chicago hip hop scene, um, they were dumbfounded when I was like, yeah, I don't feel comfortable putting out any of my stuff. I feel like it's not good enough yet. Um, and they're like, why not? <laughs> and to an extent, yeah, I should have been putting stuff out for the last 10 years, but I don't know. I've... <clears throat> I feel like I've matured in my message and I've matured in my positivity and I don't want to be putting out there's enough negative awful sh awful shit out there to be to not feel uh, to not be putting more of it out there um, and so I feel like I'm glad I waited till I had a little bit more of a handle on my depression and stuff like that before I started putting out <laughs> I don't know um, you felt like your music things. before was too to a certain extent toxic I think that uh, I was going through a toxic period of my life from like 20 to like 20, 27 or so mm -hmm. um, before I started taking care of my grandparents um, and I kind of had to like get my shit together. Um, did, did you, you didn't want to release that music because you felt it was toxic or did you, like, I was, isn't that okay that it's just what you're feeling? It is. It is, it is okay. <clears throat> but um, at the same time, I... I recognize I was self aware enough to realize I was in a in a weird place mentally, mm -hmm. uh, mental illness wise. That um, <laughs> I feel maybe we need to teach kids more of in in the face of um, Facebook and and everything, leaving a history of every thought you've put out forever. Um, <laughs> don't write everything down, you know. Uh, George Carlin said, "Write everything down, no matter what." Um, but <laughs> I don't know. You don't have to publish all of that. You don't, yeah. have, you don't have to. You There's can write difference. those. You can write those let, imaginary letters that you're angry to people, but you don't send them. Right. Um, or so, write. Have a, a notebook or a journal. Right. And that's right. what's beautiful about a journal, a notebook, um, a diary. That's why they're sacred to people. It's you can publish your thoughts and get things out there, but not make them public and published to yourself. Right. Maybe um, someone you want to share it with, but nothing public if you don't want it to be. Yeah. yeah. So I just, I don't know. To a certain extent, I imagine. Um, like Frank Zappa when he died they found a closet full of comical like imagine a cartoon of you opening a closet and papers falling out mm -hmm. a mountain of papers if it's all written music you know or like um, all the shit that uh, God, it was the big one he did uh, <laughs> he did uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey Stanley Kubrick Stanley Kubrick the mountain of material he left in his his living spaces mm -hmm. of just stuff that he worked on and decided this isn't, this isn't, this isn't the right one. Yeah. You know? Um, and there's a lot of that. I have, ugh, I could, I could fill three albums of stuff I'm not proud of, you yeah. know? Um, so I'm waiting until I get that one LP that I'm like, this is every single one of these is fucking gold mm -hmm. and it represents me as a human. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of pushing that back. <laughs> no, I feel <laughs> I'm just you. I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting for that wine to mature. I'm not trying to rush it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. in the meantime, you've been working on glass. Mm -hmm. And and putting music aside, when did you start to blow glass? And how did you get into that? How did you learn about it? Um. Well, I guess this touches on my uh, long term. Uh, relationship with cannabis um i uh no i had no idea <clears throat> really yeah it's only unclosed you know <laughs> people told me um when i was like 12 to like 15 or 16 when i first tried smoking weed um how old were you, you when first tried i want to say 16, 16 15 or 16 and you grew up in Oklahoma? i grew up in um well at that time i was living in like the stager crete area like down by University Park, uh, Chicago Heights, a little bit farther that. It's where it goes from like poor living, you know, like poor um, living area, low housing to like dense population to like cornfield mm -hmm. in like a couple miles. So, um, so we would, you know, <laughs> it's it's very strange to say 
we would equally trounce through the projects as we would like cornfields and stuff as like young um uh young 17 year olds riding bikes you know 16 year olds riding bikes around you know um i feel like i see a lot of those types around oaklawn there's, there's young men with no real direction that don't have a whole lot going on that um they they just find solace in their friends and in the area and uh i i tried cannabis um just on a side thing and it really was uh something that made me feel better immediately it's something that like uh and i didn't know at the time but like i had struggled with mental illness my entire life um mental illness is a really uh you know difficult thing to talk about but i feel like it's important to be mm -hmm. open and honest about things um and and cannabis helped with absolutely easing yes. that sorting it out yeah it. it helps um it helps uh step away from the depression you're feeling sometimes and i don't know if it's genetic disposition or some kind of injury i suffered as a child or just maybe it's just a bad attitude but something about life has not has i've not been happy with it for most of it that i can remember you know as far back as like six years old thinking about suicide and i know that's sad and i know that's really heavy but it's it's good to be open about that thing because there's people out there that think that there's something wrong with them because they feel that way mm -hmm. um six years old huh yeah and Whoa. um Sorry, I told myself I wasn't going to, like, cry. No, it's all but right. I think it's, um... <clears throat> I appreciate your honesty. Yeah, yeah. People well, people <clears throat> need to hear it, because you're not the only one who feels that way. You know, I didn't feel that way at six, but thousands, if not millions of people throughout existence have felt that way at a young age. Whether you're six or you're 60, yeah. it's not, it's it's sad. It's not. It's not good for humans to want to not be here anymore. Yeah. This should be a good place. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that speaks to, um, you know, the situation I was in as a child. Maybe it was, like I said, predisposition beyond anyone's control. Um, but <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, and that idea that, like, I think that children do recognize <laughs> they don't buy all the lies we try and tell them. Um, I have a friend um, named Lee. She's a very compassionate, very intelligent uh, woman, and her son is too intelligent. <laughs> you tell him, yeah, I'll be there in a minute, Carter. Um, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't be using names. I'm sorry. but Just don't use last names. Right, right, First right. names are fine. Right. Um, but and he knows I'm not coming over there. He knows I'm not. <laughs> he's known as I'm not going to be playing Wii with him later, and he remembers that, and he knows that I've, I've help teach him how to be an asshole. Mm -hmm. And that's hard, you know? And you got to, like, remember to... Um, I don't know. You have to remember to, uh, you know, always, I guess, teach kids how to be positive. You know, it's really, it's really, really easy to teach kids to be negative. It's really easy to teach kids to... Um, or teach anybody, I don't know, how to... Um, I'm sorry, let me back up a second. It's hard to unlearn things. Yeah. It's very difficult to unlearn things once learned. We, uh, uh, if you take a language as an example, you know, kids are able to learn multiple languages before five, before 10 years old, but trying to teach the same languages to 30 year olds is, is difficult. Very difficult. Um, so, yeah. And I feel like a lot of my adult life, a lot of my recent struggles with mental illness has been on learning and trying to like become the person I want to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's important for people to know that it's, it's okay to do that. It's okay to feel that way. It's okay to, um, you know, feel most, <laughs> most types of ways, as long as you take responsibility for it, as long as you do the next right thing and treating yourself right and making sure you're safe, making sure other people are safe, you know? And for me, I tried going through, liquor for a while that was like 25 i didn't realize at the time and i was kind of in denial but i was i was an alcoholic for sure um you, you started around 25 yeah like when i um i'm skipping a lot of things here no it's okay i uh, i'm skipping around but uh yeah i uh i drank a lot um just because i felt like i had i'd gotten my college degree 
I didn't really have a direction. I didn't know what I was doing. I was making this music, but at the same time, it wasn't really fulfilling to me. Um, and I was wondering why everything felt wrong at the time. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I would lose myself in liquor and writing music and um, making a lot of things that, uh, in, in retrospect, wasn't worth the time I was spending on it. Um, and this thing happened with my grand, the way I got out of that and why I kind of like got my shit together was that my, my grandparents, they got into a position where they, they either needed someone to care for them or, you know, they were gonna have to be put into a home or something like that. And my, my brother, because of whatever inst- extenuating circumstances, um, just life comes at things really crazy. My, my brother and I were the only people to be able to take care of that. Um, and my brother really stepped up more than I. I feel like he's my brother Cole's a very good man. Um, he's living out in Reno now, um, but he's uh, he's a very good guy. Um, and I felt like I had to help him out. And yeah, it was a very long, very intense journey between starting to take care of them in 2017, 2018, to when they passed away. Uh, they passed away two years later, so like in like pretty close to each other. Um, but it's. Do you think you know, that was because one passed away first, the other yeah, one went? Yeah, absolutely. I've heard um, that happens a lot. My grandfather, Gino Lazzarato, um, really good guy. He was a uh, rougher and a firefighter for 30 years, worked his ass off. He was one of those types. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, uh, he thought until he was, uh, he, until he was 75 or so, he thought he was invincible. Um, he would get on his roof and still fix his roof at the time. And like, he fell off of a one foot ladder, a one foot step stool, cleaning the top of his microwave. Took three steps backwards and broke the entire right side of his body. Oh, yeah, like his shoulder, hip, leg, the whole nine yards. At seventy five, um, like ish, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, um, you know, I might be having the, the numbers wrong. It's been, it's been, I, he might have been eighty. I think he was closer to ninety. Things don't heal yeah. well at the no, age. No, no, and you can't. You can't be injured at that age. You can't. No. Bottom line, if you fall, you're, you're, it's it's a slow it's a slow degradation. That's what happened. And he uh, got put into this place. Um, oh God, Saint Saint Francis over by Crete. I think it was right off of three ninety four. And um, they didn't really take well good care of him. And he wound up getting a bed sore. And he wound up. Uh, uh, it was really awful. You know, I had to watch his. We we his foot melted. You know, um, over the course of like three, three months. Um, uh, once you start down that path there's not he, he wound up losing his leg below the knee mm. um and uh yeah it was tough um it still is uh you know tough to think about but uh it's tougher to think of like how much everyone else is going through that people are still going through that every single day mm-hmm. each each one of these places is just a dumping ground for old people it's a goal of mine to never <coughs> you know put my parents into a home like that no. one day i hope to have enough income to with my siblings and, to like take care of them, you know, to avoid those things. And that's what's fucked. Like if he hadn't been able to, if he hadn't worked for 30 years to do that, you know, um, to save up money to like be able to essentially, my brother and I stopped working. We just essentially like, like a minimum wage, like ourselves into being our caretakers. And we just, we combined everything and we got this house and we uh, took care of them. And we wow, made really their lives. Nice of you to do that. Not a lot of people would do that for their grandparents, especially in their late twenties. That's like, that's like your prime to like focus on someone fifty years older when everyone else is living life and doing things. That's very admirable of you. Well, people, <clears throat> people say that. Um, sorry, I'm getting emotional. No, I mean it's true. I, I've I'm 31. I've lived past those years, and I can't imagine what I couldn't have gotten done if I was focusing on. For how many years did you take care of them? I want to say, um, I want to say it was about a full two year, two three years. Two three um, years yeah. at that age, it's detrimental um, to a, a lot of things. So no, yeah. I don't have the dates in front of me, and I feel like a weird saying, like, "Oh, it could have been this." No, but, it's okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> I, uh, but yeah, um, and my grandmother had fallen ten years previously. She was the smart, smart as a goddamn whip. Um, with numbers and math and like the whole nine yards, she was she was a very intelligent, shrewd woman. <laughs> um, 
and she fell. She had like kind of a blackout thing and she fell backwards and hit the back of her head in and uh, she wound up like reset. Like she had to like learn stuff over again oh, wow. at like 65 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had already kind of gone through this with her and we had like, since she had came back like 60% by that time, she was still like not all there, mm-hmm. but she was, we had grandma. That was great. A great 10 years. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so we had to, we had to take care of them. They had to have somebody in there to do, to do everything for them. Um, and it was tough. It was very tough. And I'm very grateful for my brother for everything he did. Um, but, uh, yeah. And once, you know, once you get, if you're, if you're an older person and you're listening and you want to live a little bit longer, here's your tips. Um, you got to drink water. I know it sucks. I know you hate drinking water. You got to drink fucking water. Um, I love water. It's my favorite right, thing. Yeah. All day. Mm. But yeah. Get rid of sugar. I heard, I've never been a water drinker. I don't like water. <laughs> I just want my coffee. You can't live on coffee. You can't. No. It's delicious. Thank you so much for the coffee. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. But, um, yeah. Um, if you stop drinking water, you either need an IV, you need to be able to pay for an IV every few days or whatever. At the end of the day, my grandparents could have lived another 20 years if I had $2 million to throw at it. Mm. I know it. 100%. You, didn't, you didn't have $2 million to throw at it, huh? I did not. Interesting. I did not have a private doctor. <laughs> Most people do not. And I know people are going to say, oh, he's just armchair doctoring and shit like that. But, I mean, <laughs> this is my jet engine. I do stuff. Like, I feel like I understand, like, uh, when when my grandfather's in pain and he needs a specific thing and we can't get it because of insurance and because we need triplicate, you know, recommendations from doctors that take a month out to to agree on anything or to get an appointment with, it's insanity. It's Yeah. No, m- money, there's a lot of pros to money and i think the biggest one is healthcare. if yeah. you have a lot of money you and you take care of yourself you can yeah. live a long life just from the proper health care the yeah. best doctors the best specialists anything that goes wrong you can get the best of it and you can pay for it right up front yeah. and insurance is not even an option if you have enough money so when you're on the opposite side of that like my grandparents were they did not get the best care and you know i remember taking my grandma to the doctor all the time and it's just such a hassle it's very stressful um, low income usually le- leads to less longevity mm-hmm. and less sustainability as far as health is considered. Um, so that's why it's like those things you can do to mitigate that is water is pretty available and pretty cheap in America. Absolutely. And uh, sugar is something that you can not consume as mm-hmm. much of or if ever again. And those two things alone yeah. will help a lot with heart disease, diabetes, Everything, your organs functioning properly are not designed to eat um, manufactured sugar, you know, granulated sugar. It's not natural in anything. No, it's, I've I've read things that it's very similar in effect to cocaine uh, in in the fact that as far as like comparing it to the the rush that we get neurologically from it and Mm -hmm. the pro, the pro benefits of it to our bodies, which are none, you know, Mm -hmm. um, it's a yeah. very quick rush mm-hmm. that is feels amazing. Like, I get it. I, I ate sugar yeah. my whole life. I, I rarely consume it now after years of testing the waters and, and seeing the results, you know? Mm-hmm. But, man, it's so bad. So many people I know have issues with heart disease. Um, heart disease, your kidneys. Kidneys, kidneys yep. liver, mm-hmm. pancreas, brain, and most of all is uh, diabetes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no. The elderly, it's... One thing we learned from COVID is how much um, we don't take care of them and how much it is, like diseases and viruses can affect yeah. people who are older. Their immune systems are not where and ours are. How much we uh, take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of people that I really i am going to break their hearts here, but they're, they're old. They're, they're listening to this and they're like, those old people need to drink fucking water. And they're 65 chugging a Coca-Cola sitting in their car. And... <laughs> No, it's I mean, okay. It's diet. I'm right, right, right. But I mean, I'm 30 and I'm old. I feel old. I have gray, singular gray hairs coming out of my beard. I have, uh, you know, a bad you're not bag. old. I know, but I know, <laughs> the fact that I took care of actual old people, um, and and you know, helped them have a comfortable passing. You know, 
uh, surrounded by flowers and shit, you know, that really gets you to appreciate like what you have now. And like, you have to get shit done before you're old, you know? And, um, number two on Max's, um, live forever, you know, checklist is find something you love to do that you can do until the day you die. Um, my grandfather was a very physical person. He liked working. He was a workaholic. I found out later on that that was actually maybe like a, a character, uh, you know, a negative character trait. It's a um, character flaw. It's a character flaw. That we, we, say, we yeah. lift up. We, we yeah. push it up on a pedestal. Workahol is deadly. No, it's it's addictive. It's, it it is I'm deadly. The same way. It, it will lead it, to too much stress. Absolutely. And I'm I honestly have gone through that myself this past year of just – wanting to work and not wanting to focus on self-care or mm -hmm. taking care of my relationships or taking care of the other things. It's like, uh, and you, you've, <laughs> I feel like you see it a lot with writers in, in their personal lives. If you ever read about like, um, Stephen King or any other like, uh, prolific writers where it's like, um, don't bother me kids. I'm working. It's mm -hmm. like, I have to do this. It's yeah. like, I have to do my work. It's like, no, I never want to say that. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, no kid should ever hear that. Right. There's um, If you're a workaholic or you have that drive, mm -hmm. which a lot of people do, some way more than others, find other avenues to put that energy. Yeah. You know, I, I, I deal with that myself to be completely transparent and honest. So I found ways to still get things done but have it be productive, therapeutic, not the same stress avenue, and you're looking at it right now. Yeah. Like we're doing it right now. Like this is extracurricular. There's no income coming here. This is just fun. And I learn a lot from people. Yeah. I hear the craziest stories right in front of me all the time. And I learn so much from it. And it's a it has a place in time. You know, there's a video, there's audio. People around the world can hear it. It could last forever. But it's just an extra quicker thing to for me to put energy and extra effort into instead of sitting around trying to get more stuff done with <clears throat> with teaching or DZ Records, DZ Fest. It's like those things are that's another thing, but this is where I can still get things done, but have it be more fun. It's a it's a hobby. I've always enjoyed talking to people. My friends can attest to that. You know, <clears throat> they even roll their eyes sometimes because I talk too much. <laughs> oh, I, get, um, I get that a lot from my partner, so I get that. Yeah, so you, well, then you might be in the same boat. It's um, So, like, why not do something with talking too much? Like, yeah. that curiosity, like, put it to use, and it could uh, inspire somebody else or influence them in a, in a good way. Certainly not striving for anything negative out of this. So yeah, I was gonna, I was saying um, earlier. I, I'm glad you do this. This is a very positive thing to learn about creative people in Chicago. It being such an expansive, densely populated area, it's crazy to me that more things like this don't don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's good to have long form discussion because you we've been programmed to be I guess addicted to like the thirty second blurb the one minute interview and mm -hmm. you just can't connect with another human in that time frame. No, um, not at all. Right. And even just, now, I feel like just now I'm getting comfortable to where my heart isn't racing and where I'm not like oh god I'm saying the wrong thing <laughs> and we're I don't know forty eight minutes in or something. <laughs> um, so yeah. Oh, it takes time. I mean, I'm used to it maybe more than you with like a camera and mic. And sitting in this table and you're here. It's you know it's but. something I lost with A, my isolation and not performing. I stopped performing right around like I wanna say twenty five. So there were two years between when I was performing music regularly, like once a week, to me just dropping out of society to me taking care of my grandparents. So um I gained my stage fright back. Mm -hmm. I went and did an open mic like six months ago and I was I was shaking and I was like, I don't remember this being like this. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, it wasn't like this. And, um, and you, if you're not getting better at something, you're getting worse at something. I know that's kind of a, a bad ultimatum. Ba ultimatums are bad, but, um, it's kind of how it is with, um, talent and with fear and with, uh, when, when you work through, I guess, something and you forget about it and you don't work on it anymore, you, you lose that, that strength, you lose that muscle in your head, um, I've uh, redeveloped um, a fear of water. I haven't been swimming in a long time, and I went swimming in this deep pool I went to as a kid. And I was like, oh, no, oh, no, I'm terrified. What, what, what scares you? Um, I think it's a primordial thing of just being like um, just from a, a jillion generations past of being a, you know, um, have you ever heard the water ape theory mm -hmm. um, that humans evolved along the coastlines and um, because we're the only ape that can swim and we're the only ape, well, that is like naturally, like if you put a baby on like 
less than six months old underwater, they know to hold their breath. Mm -hmm. That's how they got the Nevermind um, cover. Yeah. Um, but the aquatic ape, that's, is that like humans lived in trees, like mangrove forests in like F Florida and like kind of like style. Um, and our main predators were, were aquatic creatures or like we we're helpless in the water. <laughs> you know, it's just that like if, if there was, you know, and I know that's silly and I know that I, there's not a, 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 shark in the governor state university pool but it's yeah. it's difficult to convince yourself of right that. it's it's difficult it's to an like epigenetic thing, unlearn you know, that. that could yeah. be passed on yeah. just like mm -hmm. heights yeah dark spots critters like spiders yeah. and snakes all these things by the way i don't know why something's wrong with my brain i have zero fear of these things i can't yeah. explain all it. the things you just said i'm afraid of most yeah. people all actually over, are uh, but <laughs> which is probably a good thing i feel like you have to face your fears i feel yeah. like that's what the magic of if magic is real, that's what human that's what humans do is they become greater than they are. They they face that um, that fear that uh, the bringing light to the darkness, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, well, we seem to be, <clears throat> to the best of our own knowledge, one of the only animals, and specifically mammals, that can conjure up um, past, present, and future, so we could figure yes. out how to get through or past something. So an animal might react to a fear like you know, bull the dog on the couch hears a car pulling or a knock. And instead of getting up to be like, oh, it's noon and it's Tuesday and Ben's calendar says like he's having a guest come in for a podcast and he could r use rationale, logic, and a consciousness to be like, oh, it's nothing. It's not an intruder. Instead, he has to react every single time the same way. It's an intruder. I must bark and I must go see what it is. Mm -hmm. And within seconds, he's like, oh, this is nothing dangerous. And he starts smelling and like, right. it's fine. But we can be like, this is a pool. There's a deep end and a shallow end. If, it, if I get too overwhelmed, I could just go over to the shallow end or I can grab the edge of the pool because it's only five feet away. But for some reason, there's something deep inside that you can eventually get to that. It just takes practice. Yeah. That's the cool thing about being human is you can kind of get through almost anything within reason. It just takes effort, practice, and like overriding that, you know, control, delete that fear. Mm -hmm. It's innate to you. A lot of animals can't do that, don't know how to do it. Don't even think they can rationalize the idea of wanting to do that. I don't know if they can at all, but humans can. So I always tell people, because I'm, I'm fortunate to not have those fears. It's allowed me to do some wacky stuff, but there's other fears I have. So I have to figure out ways around that. But heights, swimming, bugs, insects, that none of those things scare me at all. Um, and most of it's just like I rational, like, rationalize it. Like we live by fresh water, so there's really nothing scary in the water. No, not here. We live in a cold climate, so there's really not bad insects and, rep and reptiles that are that dangerous. Mm -hmm. there's n we also live in a place where there's not really any big predators that are scary, like bears and wolves and lions and rhinos, like nothing like that exists around here. So like, what are we actually afraid of? Like, I'm more afraid mm -hmm. of the humans around here, to be honest. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. You yeah. know. Um, that's a much more tangible threat. <laughs> yeah. That's why I always don't understand. But I realize it's way more in-depth and way more innate. Also kind of taught. We're taught to be afraid of those things for oh, some yeah, parents are overbearing. Oh yeah, you know mm -hmm. they're telling their kids don't do, don't climb up there, don't do this, yeah. don't do that. I was always told like go do that, like right. get out of here, I go climb. Like right. I grew up swimming, I grew up on a lake house, yeah, absolutely. swimming all summer, so water doesn't scare me at all. I miss I miss swimming dearly. Actually, I really, I really did love it. Um, and if we were in, a, I mean, I guess a different place, I with more access to natural swimming, I'd love to do that as well. But mm -hmm. um, all of my swimming as an, a, a Chicago raised child was pools only yeah. pools so yeah. um no like michigan seaweed touching my foot is like it's like nails on a chalkboard it's something <laughs> it's funny because it's really just like underwater grass i know that it's hasn't cute. been it's, mowed it's so great. it just grows long yeah um <laughs> that's pretty much it yeah it's very wholesome yeah. but the the sensation is not mm -hmm. um but uh yeah i um <clears throat> i actually I, I don't think i brought it in but I want to talk about rope dart, I, uh, just to bring everything to a rope point. Rope dart? Yeah, um, to uh, something you need to do until, something that'll help with your mental illness, something that you can fall in love with until the day you die, something um, that helps you focus on, that helps you face your fears, that helps you um, do that. I, I um, was stumbling upon videos um, when I, uh, I know this is going to come as a shock too, I've taken psychedelics um, no 
<laughs> Let me guess. But, mushrooms. I actually, I'm I'm more of a fan of of LSD personally. Oh. I, um, it's much more academic. Mushrooms are very emotional. I they sure are. Down. Um, <laughs> I like. Yeah, I like. <laughs> I've only done acid once. Reading books you, and shit. Have you done it a lot of times? I would say like maybe maybe a dozen. I'd like um, to do it a dozen times. It just it's um, not as easy to come by. And out of that, I'd say two of them were. People say that there's bad trips and they can be harmful to you. And 100, percent you can really fracture your psyche if you take a shit ton of mushrooms and you're predisposed to psych- <laughs> schizophrenia. And Absolutely. You have a mental breakdown and you end up in the psych ward for six months. So please, please take take some caution and learn about yourself and see a mental health therapist before you do any psychedelics um, and know what's going on with you. But um, yeah, I, uh, I I was I took gas and I was it was during my sabbatical and I was trying to figure out what I want to do with my life and what what is going to give me purpose and meaning and I found the rope dart um, and uh, I stumbled upon this video by Frank Hatzis um, and he is a guy that started the Rope Dart Academy um, and he's he studied wushu and it's essentially it's one of the wushu soft weapons it's um, it's I use a bean bag that's uh, <laughs> an eight ounce bean bag <clears throat> on a ten foot rope. Um, and unless I did it, I couldn't really explain what you do with it. You wrap it around yourself and use it as a, uh, it was one of the few, um, long range weapons before the invention of gunpowder. It was bows and arrows and slingshots and rope dart or meteor hammer or whatever you want to call it. Um, and you wrap it around yourself and shoot it off of yourself when some, and don't use your hands half of the time. And it's very, um, it's in the same family as poi. And I don't know if you've ever seen rope darts, people spinning fire. Um, I just stumbled upon this video, this guy doing ninja shit in, uh, in, the, in a park and why he really loves it and why it's really meaningful to him. And it really resonated with me. And so the next day I built a rope dart. I, I got a, uh, a, a, Kong, uh, a Kong ball, a, do- a, doll, a dog toy Kong ball, and I wrapped it in a special monkey fist knot. And I had a 10-foot rope trailing from it, and I spun it around until it exploded, and the, the ball shot out because I didn't do it right. And I, mm-hmm. I did that like three or four times, and I, I made one that worked, and I started swinging it. And I started just just doing that and trying to start and do the first wraps. And, um, yeah, I've been doing it almost every day for like a year and a half now. I actually I spun fire for the first time a couple weeks ago, um, and it was very – very empowering. It's. I feel better about that fire spinning like session than I do about graduating college. I'm gonna be real with you. It was hmm. just very like. Um, it was very empowering because I had never planned in my whole life to be a fire spinner. What, what do you think made it so empowering? Just spinning fire. Um. <laughs> I think well because. I didn't realize that I was going to spin fire until like three months into learning rope dart and I was, and I saw somebody spin fire with a rope dart and I realized, oh, that's what I'm going to have to do at some point. Like. Why? I have to. Well, because I want to be the best. I I fall in love. I, I, you described someone, um, having a childlike joy for skateboarding. Um, and I feel the same way. I just, if I want a billion dollars, all I would do is like make glass art and do rope dart all day. That's all I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, it's one of those things that just brings. Uh, I think what it is neurologically, psychologically, is that it's really hard. It's really hard not to fucking nail yourself with this thing. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what kept me from learning when I was in college and I saw someone learning poi. I'm not sure if you're are you familiar with it. Mm-hmm. I wish I'd brought my stuff in. Um, <laughs> I already brought too much stuff, and it's I okay. haven't talked about any of it. I'm it's sorry. Okay. No, we'll get. To, we have time. <laughs> um, but um, they're essentially they're balls um, on like two or three feet long strings, and you spin them. If you've ever seen um, fire spinning or like Hawaiian fire spinners, that's usually what they spin is poi. Um, and then the rope dart is much longer. Um, <clears throat> but uh, all of the flow arts are they're they have evolved from dance and martial art traditions from across the globe. Um, and they essentially use these props for dance, for performance, um, and in some cases, people still do train for martial arts with them. Um, I actually, uh, yeah, I thought I brought it in, but I didn't. I'm sorry. I keep glancing around like a crazy person. Um, but I actually made some uh, 
some glass meteor hammers. Um, some like uh, they're about this big and they're meant to be spun around. And um, <laughs> that's something I want to come back to when I'm both a better glass uh, blower and a better dartist. But um, yeah, I uh, it's it's a fascinating thing and it's something that you can do. It's very low impact on the joints. Um, uh, I would really say check out flowtoys.com, check out ropedartacademy.com because they'll give you a different, they'll give you all the different, um, like, I'm a big proponent both magically and just as a person to be like, I think you need to like choose a weapon and I get it. There's people that are screaming at the podcast like the gun is the best weapon. You got to have a gun, second amendment, you got to have it. Otherwise you're not, uh, uh, uh. but <laughs> I mean, I think that, Guns are great. Okay, great. But, I mean, you have to have something that requires discipline, that requires, like, um, you don't have to. But for me, it's been very helpful to have something that requires discipline to to learn because otherwise you hit yourself with it and you feel silly, but it's funny. And I... Uh, <clears throat> It's it's very fun because it is difficult. It requires such a, a focus of hand-eye coordination and um, please don't hit myself with this that I can't be depressed. I can't think of like – I can't get down on myself or like tear myself apart because I'm really focused on this one thing right now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, like making – I think there may be theta waves. I forget what is actually triggered in your brain when you're so focused on something. Flow, a flow, this book by – a. <laughs> Polish author, I cannot pronounce their name of, Mikhail Lainley, something like that. But mm -hmm. they have this flow psychology of like how your whole day is supposed to be a play or supposed to be play. You're supposed to treat it like play. You're supposed to flow from like work from one thing to another so your brain doesn't get bogged down and and sludgy and and hopeless. Um, you have to you have to change things up in order to get that same feeling that surgeons and and symphony musicians and regular musicians get when they're deep in the flow and they feel the rhythm and they, they're, they're not thinking with their forebrain, it's just going, you know, in the same way that you don't think of two plus two as, okay, add the one, now add the one, now we're at four. It's, it's instinctive. It's, I don't know. I feel like I'm ranting. No, it's but, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's... Uh, It's it's under the same guise of why people like working out. Yeah. Why people like picking up an instrument. It's challenging. It, it allows you to put your focus on the one thing so you can not neglect, but start to realize that the one thing you've been pestering about and, mm -hmm. and focusing on spiraling about starts to kind of get smaller and more in the background and less in the foreground. And that's something I've heard from a lot of people who struggle with mental illnesses such as depression, anxiety, extreme forms of that um, – you know, bipolar, borderline mm -hmm. personality disorder is, you know, <clears throat> I had someone explain it to me actually on the podcast, but I've heard it outside of this. And it's just kind of like, as you propel yourself through the day, you hit a problem, you hit a wall and you spiral around it. Whereas most people just kind of bend around that. So that bend around the problem still takes time. It, yeah. it disrupts you, but it's just a small bend in your linear time. Right. And, and you can kind of keep going forward around it. You learn from it like, okay, now that next bend is smaller. The, the, the less, you know, passive the least resistance get a little bit smaller, not as hard. Whereas someone who hits that with a certain mental illness can get bogged by it and they start spiraling and they can't go forward. And then by the time they come out, they might not know which way was the way they got in and out and they're kind of stuck. And it becomes where alcohol and certain drugs start to be the only thing that can kind of slow that down, make it less chaotic, you know, make it less like things are going right at you. And that's the problem with alcohol. It's such a fun drug, to be honest. But what it does to you is so harsh. Like, even it's if you poison. don't have a mental illness, it's rough on you. Know? Physically, it's a poison, unfortunately. As, yeah. as much as it triggers the feelings of wholesomeness and well-being and excitement, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's really bad for your body. It's a hard balance. I yeah. I love to drink, but I've never been a big drinker, and the only reason why is I hate not being productive. Yeah. So when I wake up the next day and I feel bad, feel foggy, I didn't sleep well, <clears throat> I might regret just doing it, and it beat, you beat yourself up about it. Yeah. Now I'm not that productive that day. So right. I prefer productivity and progress 
over drinking, but I love drinking, so I oh, it always just trumps it. Yeah, and I don't. It's it's a weird feeling to have, but it that's just how I operate. It's the only way to get and through it. Honestly, I think that's uh, honestly I. <laughs> In another world, I'm insulted that you described me so perfectly with that BPD thing. No, I, I, um, but I really do feel like that. That's how it is. Is that um, both cannabis and I use the um, rope dart as a focal point. Mm-hmm. But between that and also cannabis is an excellent tool for it. But getting out of that spiral is very difficult. Yes. Once you lock into it, and I'm not sure if I have BPD. Every time someone describes it to me, it personality sounds disorder. Like, yeah, bro. Every time someone describes it to me, I get more of a feeling like, God damn it, that's me. I fucking, <laughs> that's, oh no, they're describing my personality, my, my deepest flaws as a human. I think you would I, know if you had it because the people in your life would be like, if you hit thirty and you yeah. and you have it, you would know someone's going to tell you something's not right. Uh, so, wow. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, I unfortunately yeah. have had people in my life with that, and they find before thirty ish, yeah. you will someone's going to let you know because things are not going. Yeah, well. I guess I just I, I think I sac- I suffer from a bit of lack of self confidence. I keep going to people and saying I think I have this, and they're like, No, you don't fucking have. It. You, your <laughs> I, people in your I've, your family or friends would be like, Max, we got to talk to you. I've had multiple. I've had a therapist laugh at me for saying I think I might be autistic. Because I guess autistic people don't usually have that thought. And because I am Don't have very, what thought? I think I might be autistic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nobody's telling me, but I think I might be autistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it sounds just but, like more of like a general anxiety. Like yeah, you're just worried yeah. about stuff. Yeah. And, That's all. And it's, it's, I don't know. Part of me is like, how can everybody not be worried about stuff? <laughs> but, you might just be um, more in your head about it. But yeah, know? yeah. And, um, but... Flow Arts has helped me immensely. And honestly, I cover a lot of fun stuff under Flow Arts. I cover anything that you can do trick shots with, anything that you can, any kind of tool or weapon or fun toy you focus on. Kendamas are, are, are flow toys in my, in my definition. Skateboards. I saw a guy do a backflip on a BMX bike, and I know he spent a million fucking hours on that bike. Um... He loves that bike. Yeah. And I feel that same way about these stupid bean bags on ropes I have. Um, and the metal one I got. And like um and when I get a fire dart, I'm sure I'm gonna feel the same way about that. Um and it's these um these archetypal things we carry in us that help us strengthen us. Mm-hmm. Um and a lot of cultures have that as like uh burial weapons. You bring weapons into the afterlife with you, that kind of thing. Um I found that very uh very magical and very, I don't know, inspiring. And um, I suppose to a certain, it's its very, I never would have imagined at 15, like, oh, you want to describe a perfect weekend as me just smoking a lot of weed and doing weapons training. It's like, no, I never would have imagined. I'm not a weapons guy. I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not an aggro guy. I'm not. And honestly, that kind of ties into it too. Something I, I feel like compelled to be open about, especially with people our age and especially with like um, the state of, what is going on in the country with the last election and with what's probably going to happen with the next one is like um, one of the reasons that I feel like I really had major mental health issues in my mid twenties and um, all of that is that I had, uh, I found out I had very low testosterone. Um, And that's something that like, again, whether through injury or like uh, genetic predisposition or whatever, um, I found out I had, (coughs) excuse me, really low testosterone and it honestly personally i think it might be a little bit from the cannabis but i don't know is Um, that a side effect it is a slight side effect is an increased estrogen like uh, a a tendency to have an increased estrogen and lower testosterone if you smoke a lot i smoke a shit ton you do right now you do i'm sorry yeah (laughs) i do yeah i I mean i'm not high right now but i definitely (laughs) yeah got high before i got here but um how long you've been smoking weed since since 16 um no, I took three years off because, oh God, I feel like I skipped. I was going to go on a whole tangent. I got, it's okay. I got kicked out of Marian Catholic for bringing weed on a band trip. Nice. And when my mom passed away at 17, they let me back in and I graduated from there. Oh. So I have they a felt huge, bad, huh? Yeah. And my brother was still going there. So I had to drive them and they were super, I grew up in kind of a little bit of a, I'm not sure if anybody from the south side of Chicago knows about this, but there's... A little bit of a toxic culture when it comes to, like, I don't know, sending kids to Catholic school because they don't want to be around those kids. I don't know. I, I grew up in a um, 
my mom wanted to be Irish Catholic, but we were just like Irish. Um, but they were very like. I, ho- I was hoping you'd say like we were like German, so she couldn't be Irish. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, bad, half German, bad or, joke. some German Irish. No, um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, and there was this. Like, they wanted us to go to the better school. They wanted mm-hmm. us to go to college. And then yeah. it's part of this kind of toxic culture where you got to go to college or you don't have any, like, what are you doing with your fucking life? Like, yeah. we worked all this to get you to there. And it's like, your life is a bit decided for you. And I, I, I've heard that kind of sentiment expressed by a few of your guests in the past mm-hmm. um, from parents. And, um, yeah, I can't imagine. I work for a, a – I haven't mentioned this either. My day job is at a cannabis dispensary. <laughs> Nice. Um, yeah. So I can't imagine, like, if my parents were cool with me at 17 going to the West Coast and learning how to do weed, grow weed and supporting that and, like, helping me out, I'd be a goddamn millionaire right now. Like, for real. Um, <clears throat> but or, like, or you'd have a good living. Or I'd have <laughs> a really cool story and be living on the side of a road in fucking Sacramento. Yeah, or it's hard to really say. A skid row. Like, <laughs> what, what college but, did you end up going to? Oh, Jesus. I went to Marion University in Indianapolis. I, I was lost. My mother had passed away, and my stepfather was kind of an asshole and kind of kicked my brother out when he was 18. And um, it was this whole fucking thing. And... Uh, I didn't really have anywhere else to go. And so my friend, uh, my friend Diego was like, hey, they're doing this band program. Down. I was a huge band nerd. Drumline was the biggest fucking thing for me at the time. I the loved- movie? I'm no. Just I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but like um, doing drums and stuff and, and snare and doing like being the best at something, something I could be the best at genuinely um, and put the hours in. And, um, and they were putting this thing together and it was very like <clears> – <throat> The guy putting it together had money, and he was convincing people to give him money, and there, he was promising a lot of things that didn't end up being delivered. <laughs> so he had a lot of very talented people gathered here to build a drum line in Indianapolis, and I'm very happy to have been a part of it. I got to work with Mike McIntosh from the Cavaliers. I got to learn snare drum at a level that most people don't get to hear or see or understand, and I feel really cool about that. I, I feel really blessed about that. I know he's bored blessed a lot, but... Um, I feel good about that. Um, but in retrospect, it's like I grew up really not liking Catholic schools. I grew up my whole life being forced to be in Catholic schools. The first chance I had to be free, why, why did I choose a goddamn Catholic school? Why did I do that? Because I was trying Creature to go with my habit. friends. I was, yeah, I was trying to like stick with some kind of structure and those yeah. friends I had were the only kind of structure I had. Um, so, and I met a lot of really good people down there. I met a lot of real assholes. I had a, a great time. I was introduced to psychedelics and had a had a day in the forest with my best friend and my my the person I loved at the time and it was very good and it was a very positive experience overall as colleges go um but then I started getting amp- apathetic and all of these things that were building up my ADHD all that depression I was smoking at the time and that kind of helped but it also made the ADHD worse mm-hmm. and um just getting over like the grief of my mom and like my weird family getting kind of broken up and it was just it was a rough time and uh i wound up transferring to saint xavier (laughs) um which funnily enough was their rival football team (laughs) Mm. and uh because uh my uncle uh lived out here in blue island i was staying there and it was um it was good in the sense that i'm glad i finished college i'm glad i have that degree would would you uh major oh uh so here's the here's the list now uh i was Music education to begin with. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to teach percussion. I wanted to start a, I wanted to teach drumline. I wanted to be involved with that for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time, uh, there was an asshole that got elected to a uh, governor there, and everyone under 40 that was a music teacher lost their job because there's just no funding. That's not necessary for schooling. And everyone I knew was moving to Texas because every single school in Texas has four music teachers. Um, it's wild. Um, mm. They really are economically better than Chicago for sure, um, but I uh, or Indianapolis for sure. For the, for anybody listening who puts law into actualization and actually yeah. does things with law, um, the arts is important. One hundred percent. It's equally as important as math, science, and English. And I would go. Um, I'd, I'd debate that till the day I die. You got to have people a reason to keep this society functioning. You got to have people. You got to have. You got to give people a reason, a function for value. I don't know. Like it's it's so simple. Just think about everything you do outside of your job. 
it's something creative or you watch something creative, you participate yeah. in something creative, you enjoy something creative, you admire something creative. You watch award shows from people who are creative. Yeah. The Grammys, the Tonys, the Oscars, all creative endeavors. Yeah. Guess what award shows you don't watch? The Nobel Peace Prize, the Pulitzer Prize. You don't watch the scientific and literature <laughs> awards. You watch no. art o- awards, you idiots. Like, what are we doing? Even athletics is an art form. I grew up playing sports. It takes physical agility, but it also takes creativity to be able to map out things and accomplish a goal, accomplish a plan, accomplish a scheme that you came up with with your quarterback or your shooting guard. There's so much creativity in everything, and it's completely overlooked because of the value we bestow upon it. You know, it's it's not good. I, I work in the creative technologies at ISU, and it's amazing the stuff that these students can do and, and where music, art, illustration, drawing, poetry, all these things come together. People sit down and read books for fun. What do you think a book is? It's from a writer. A writer's doing something creative. They're using language to express something. Even if it's nonfiction or fiction, it doesn't really matter. They're doing something creative. And guess how that book gets to you? It goes to an editor. An editor is using the right way. It's more scientific. It's more analytic. The right way to say words and, and, and use language. But they're still using creativity and how you even do that. It goes up and down the chain, and it's completely overlooked. It's very annoying. Even this coffee you had took a lot of creativity to get to where it's at. It took a lot of science. There's a lot of different things going on with how the, the cherry pit, which is the bean, was grown, you know, in this, in this case, Honduras, and how it got to America, but then how it was roasted, how it was put into a bag and labeled with, you know, a graphic designer on a website designed by a graphic designer a designer that used science technology such as computer science that was made the website like Squarespace for you, mm-hmm. the artist, to put it together. There's, they go hand in hand yeah. all day, every day, in every way, shape, or form. When you come home from your job you hate, <clears throat> which is millions of people, <clears throat> they put on music. The music is coming out of a stereo that an engineer designed. So science came together to propagate art. And you sit there listening to it, that those lyrics bring you back to a place, might make you feel emotional, might make you feel loved or think about the person you first met when you heard that song, maybe a friend, a time and space, a campfire, being a kid. It can make you emotional. It can make you want to put on a different song because you don't like that one. You're just going through creative outlets. You know, It's so a part of our lives, and it's very frustrating when people don't put funding in or they say it's not worth it or like, why are you going to go in the arts? It's like... Are you serious? Like, right. it's everything. It's always been everything. It's what makes us human. Yeah. I, I feel like you would need a reason to live. You need to find something to pursue, some kind of purpose. You need, um, and even if, it's the, even if that's just making something you want to make. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the first time one of our ancestors looked around and said, I like this rock. I'm going to move this rock just because I like where it's at. <laughs> that was ever since then, you know. Um, that's, uh, and that's all of that. That's everything we value as humans is um, creativity. Uh, and the people that don't, the people that, that do have power, that want to make other people lesser for any other reason, like that's, those are the people that are sick. Those are the people that are like are missing something. Well, they usually had an, obs- an, 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 an obsession with greed, money. Yeah, um, yeah. And it comes down to self worth, and it comes down to I feel like it's it's a shame that we don't have a word in English for it. But um, Schadenfreude, Schadenfreude, Schadenfreude. Yeah, Schadenfreude. It's a word in German that means the joy you get from other people's suffering. Ooh. And it's essentially the entire bedrock of American society. That's what the prison system is built on. The prison system is not there to reform people or make them less prone to pro- crime. They are there. The prison system exists as a as a whole to make people feel better about their lives, make them feel better than someone. So that, hey, mm-hmm. I'm not a criminal. Those damn criminals deserve what they're getting. Yeah. You get a you brand know? on your forehead, felon. Right, you know? right. And have fun finding work, going to school, it's, anything. It's amazing to me that I hear these people talk about how terrible um, China's social credit system is when we kind of already have one here. I mean, we already have the credit system. 
that's run by, you know, companies outside of the U.S. that are not 100% based in the U.S. It's it's just wild to me that we have this, I don't know, this strange system. Um, and we put people the, in prison for yeah. marijuana when now it's legal in, what, 13 states or so? And it's I guarantee in the next five years it's going to be legal in almost all states. I need to, before I start talking about my employers, I feel like I need to make a disclaimer that Cure Leaf is a great company to work for. And <laughs> I, you nothing even have I'm to say who you work for. Is, <laughs> no, because I feel like it's uh, what I'm going to say is important that I say the names and I say I'd be you know honest and everything like that. Because I I'm also going to say that like the dispensary I work at um, is is one of the best dispensaries in Illinois. I would I would venture that the people I work with are intelligent. They're hardworking. They go out of their way to make sure that everyone that comes in there knows what's going on, knows what they're buying, and is happy with what they're getting. And I'm really happy and proud to work with the people I work with there. Um, but these prices. But these prices. I went to Denver the, recently. I um, They got us beat by a lot. It's insane that... And and also, I'm going to disclaimer, any numbers I say are at least six, three, three to six months old, so I'm not breaking any kind of, you know, I'm not doing any kind of, like, wrong financial things here or saying anything bad that's illegal. I really like my job and I like to keep it, but also um, I feel like I'm entitled to my opinion on these things. Sure. And I feel like, you know, um, I do want people to come in and see me and buy weed from us at the dispensary, but also, like... The system is just completely fucked up. Mm -hmm. It's it was written wrong. The laws are written wrong, and I feel like because of the system, you know, we're put in positions to sell stuff that isn't necessarily one hundred percent medicinal for people. You know, uh, especially for the pricing. You know, uh, Rick Simpson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He invented Rick Simpson oil. He's a Canadian. He uh, made cannabis oil illegally for years because he claimed it cured cancer and now it turns out it's pretty close. Uh, it doesn't cure cancer. Uh, we don't have any scientific proof that it kills cancer cells, but anecdotally he swears up and down by it and he should have been dead 30 years ago. So um, maybe he's wrong about that, but he recommends 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of THC a day for 30 days if you have terminal cancer and you're trying to beat it. Um, and he says that will help you live. That will that will give you a Talk much, about being stoned. much better. Yeah, that is that is <laughs> that's excessive. If I was going to compare that to alcohol, that's the equivalent of drinking two fifths a day, or something like that. Like that's how do you even make those comparisons? I I, I make I feel like I'm forced to. I uh, as a as a cannabis like instructor, patient counselor for mostly older folks on the South Chicagoland area. I'm constant, and I did this with my grandparents. I taught them about cannabis because my grandfather was actually diagnosed with cancer when he lost his knee. They found out he had cancer. Um, and so it's like that's the, that's the only drug Americans, the last generation of Americans, the majority of them had access to. That's the only thing that they understand when you say drug. That's it, is alcohol. Um, so that's the only psych any kind of like psychoactive thing they've had in their lives. So when I explain that, like just quantities and amounts, like if you wanted to buy an eighth, that's that'll get you as stoned as many times as this twelve pack will get you drunk, you know, or something like sure. that. Um, and I know that it loses quantification when you get to those insane levels because it becomes something else entirely. Um, at those dosages, at those dosages, like cannabis is essentially a sedative, like. Hardcore, especially if you're eating it. Um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm knocked out if I had 2,000 milligrams but, of an edible. There's no but, way. Um, but over the course of like the week, you start to like wake up and you're like, oh, okay. And by the end of that, you're sober. You're like sober at like day 30. You still get kind of a buzz, but you've your, your tolerance is your through endocannabinoid the roof. <laughs> system has stopped registering the gargantuan amounts of shit you're eating. <laughs> yeah. And allegedly, the amount of THC in your system is so saturated that it literally is touching cancer cells. You know, um, hmm. so there's, it's not, is insane. there scientific data on this there? It's illegal to conduct scientific data. Of course it's been, and if that was a, one of the laws that was in place was that you cannot make a study unless the hypothesis specifically states that you're trying to find something bad about cannabis. Hmm. Like you can't research good shit about cannabis. The, the only thing I've ever found bad about cannabis is Two things. Paranoia. Yeah. Which can happen. It happens to me. I have mm -hmm. to, I get really cold too. I get chills. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm always hot and I'll throw on blankets. 
But um, aside from that, which something I can usually override when I realize it's just paranoia and I need to right. like, get over it, I would say mostly is um, people should probably not smoke it in their teenage years. Like, as a I don't think person. so either. I don't right? think it's good for your brain development. I think that, um, you know, at the time... Uh, it's the only thing I had access to. And we're currently entering a golden age of medica- of medicine. It's unfortunately not all of us are rich enough to access it. But, um, you know, if I, again, if I was a billionaire, if I, if I um, marry Jeff Bezos tomorrow. You and, can now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I would separate all the cannabinoids. I'd be like, okay, give me a gram of THCV. I want to see what that does. And give me a gram of THC, you know, or like there's like, uh, the cannabis plant is a melange of spices, of chemicals. That's like what they scared us about in, in grade school, about it being having a million chemicals. It's actually a, it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that we have so many productive medicines coming from one plant. And some of them are contradictory. That's why you're like, you get stoned and you're like, I'm hungry, but my stomach, I don't want to eat and I'm tired, but I want to get up and fight. I want to fight. Like, <laughs> it's like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? It's because you're taking this plant that has literally, you're taking a cornucopia of psychedelics um, and separating those out. You know, heavy indicas will give you the munchies because there's CBN in it. And that are CB, yeah, CBN and CB, uh, the other heavy one. But, um, and then, there's yeah. some there's some that like uh, African land race land race means it's it's like native from an area but African land race uh, strains like Durban and stuff they are high in th uh, THCV which is allegedly an appetite suppressant so like really like racy indicas or racy sativas um, uh, will give you like it, you just get up and go juice it's like I, I mostly smoke I mostly do dabs and I mostly do sativas because I don't have trouble eating and I want to be able to get up and work um, most of the time when I smoke I don't sit around and do sh- like watch TV I, I get up and I blow glass I, 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 I you make I, bowls I make bowls yeah these bowls are cool by the way thank you man can we, can we talk about how you blow glass absolutely I have a confession to make I'm not a glass blower I'm a lamp worker. What's when that? When people say glass blowing, uh, traditionally they're talking about Italian style glass blowing, or like what you see on Netflix with the glory hole and the soft glass. Um, I guess let's talk about the worlds of glass. Um, I melt borosilicate. This is American borosilicate. It's the strongest glass you can buy. Um, it's scientific glass, the kind they use for beakers and stuff. Um, what makes it that is the coefficient of expansion. That's a fancy scientific word for just says how much it changes when it goes from liquid to solid. Uh, I guess like when you see an ice cube form and it changes like the volume, you could call that the coefficient of expansion. So the softest is soft art glass. It's like 110, 106 COE. That's the kind of things you see like like old ladies, like little torches making beads. What does like COE stand for? Uh, coefficient of expansion. Okay. Yeah, but that's just the scientific number that says like how much it it expands or contracts when it goes from liquid to solid. Got it. Um, so like you can't mix glasses. You have the soft glasses, which are like the really pastel-y like old lady ones that are really easy to melt. They are almost, you just basically take a little propane torch to it almost no heat will melt it and then they're good to go and you just you know they're good um then you have uh like plate glass and stuff like that the kind of uh the way they make windows is they just have these like mile long troughs of melted glass and they all mix the coes together and they're giving that much space allows it to co-mingle um without cracking because if i were to mix this with soft glass or just like a bottle I melted, it would explode when it cooled because they're it's two separate substances trying to meld together like liquid, like oil and uh, water mm-hmm. trying to mix. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you get down to the lower ones, and this is um, Pyrex borosilicate, essentially the same. The brand name Pyrex used borosilicate, but uh, yeah, I. I didn't bring in the blowpipe. I kind of panicked at the beginning. Didn't bring in as much stuff as I was going to. I have a whole car Why'd full of panic? stuff. I don't know because um, it just seemed like a lot. But I use uh, this here. This is um, this is a uh, GTT torch. That's uh, I forget what the G starts for. Griffin Torch Technologies. Um, but they're an old school. One of the first ones. Um, it's essentially a jet torch. I have a uh, propane tank and an oxygen tank I run to this and it's a 
three-stage torch. Um, so what I do is I just uh, I turn on the propane a little bit. That's like the main throttle. And these are the two oxygens. And if you actually look up close to the tip of it, there's holes inside the holes inside the holes. Yeah. Um, and that allows it to change shape. I can change this flame from a big, wide, fat, soft flame, like a big roasting, like flamethrower, to just this needle sharp little laser mm. um, to do all this detail stuff. And where um, does the color come from? The color comes from American dirt and metals. Um, it's all American made. Um, the way that you make borosilk is you take silica dust, silica, like mineral, um, and you mix it with various oxides, various like metal dusts. And most of these colors were, all of these colors were invented in America by American chemists um, over the course of the 60s and 70s. I can't remember the young ladies, not young anymore, the lady's name that uh, invented amber purple, but this is what has made um, American glass famous is the striking colors. Um, depending on the composition of the flame, as you change it between more propane and more oxygen, you can change the colors oh, um, wow. as it like cools. Here's a little snowman guy I met by. I made it whipping up amber purple and different colors, and <laughs> it's kind of silly, but it gives you like it shows you like the different colors you can get from it. So how do you get marble. the different shapes? How do you control the shape? Um, so this is like a blow tube right here. Um, Essentially, what I do is I buy a standard size tubing, and I will. I have a little rubber thing that goes on the ends, and I have a little swivel and a blow pipe that fits. I wrap it around my neck, and I will uh, heat stuff up here. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a piece that uh, that I combine from two separate uh, straight line tubing, um, just to give you a, like an idea of like start to finish. I, you went through like a product line earlier and I was like, oh, I, I was going to think the same thing. But so we have American miners that get the silica and get the metal out of the ground. They go to a production company like North Star Glass or TAG or Glass Alchemy. They're all people who have been making glass for many years. Most of them are either chemists as background or glass workers just doing that. Um, and they make it, they have these big cauldrons they dump all that stuff into and they pull it out and they make stringers and they make uh, tubing. Um, and then I buy that or they send the stringers to a company that makes this uh, line tubing. And there's some companies out there that they just take tubes. Um, if you want to hold that. Um, if you look at the end, there's layers to it. There's like a clear layer outside and a black layer inside and they lay these strings of tubing in between and they suck all the air out of it. Mm. And that makes the line tubing. And then from there, I can shape it into stuff like this. Um, and what's with this glitter? Oh, so <laughs> I skipped over the cool part. Yeah. Um, dichroic. Dichromatic metal um, coatings. It's something that was invented in America. They use it in aerospace stuff. They use it in visors and heads-up displays and, uh, jet in and like jet cockpits and stuff. But it is... Um, imagine a room... Uh, about this size, it's vacuum sealed. They suck all the air out of the room. And in the middle of the room, they have a bucket. They put a bunch of random metals in the bucket um, and they hang panes of glass around it. Um, then they shoot the metal bucket with a laser until it explodes in the vacuum. And it shoots out and hits the glass and sticks and leaves these micron thin shards of metal embedded in it. And depending on the temperature, and the different variables and the metal in the bucket, they can get these different colors. They can make different patterns. Um, Who in the world came up with this concept? <laughs> Americans. Let's we shoot fucking lasers. Nuts. Into, yeah. We just got to do everything to the most access. It's huh? so nuts. and <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. It's so magical. And um, yeah, and they, here's, a, here's a clear one with some green in That's it. That's a tiny bowl. It is. It's a little baby bowl. I didn't want to waste the tubing. It's 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 expensive. The the dichroic is difficult to make, and um, it's it's just fascinating. Very cool. This is a little one with a little with a little jar guy. Yeah. What's up with this? It's just a little jar pendant. Keep your tic tacs in it. Yeah. Tic tacs. Do shots out of it. Right. A little <laughs> slotcha. Um, and yeah. all this. How was it? Um. There's like no chemicals. It's all safe. To, safe to consume. Anything that touches it. It is. Um. When it comes to uh, glassware and stuff, yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> there's, I'm actually a member of a group on Facebook, and it's very heated. Um, <coughs> it's called Dildos or Dildon'ts, and it's, uh, it's the nerds that 
or into glass blowing and decide to make glass dildos. And wait, wait. So the glass blowing group is very heated. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, this is why I'm not a comedian. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so well, tell me why it's heated. Well, I have this working psych- psychology theory that the more esoteric and like specialized your niche or your hobby is, the more full of yourself you get and like the more you're like I'm I'm the big fish in the pond and I know everything about this cuz I built a fucking <laughs> I built a glass do- glowing studio in my garage so I know what's up and it's very like you know you're going to kill someone with that and like no you're going to so there's you very some conflicting dildos, yeah right um but <laughs> So when it comes to internal use, I would say stick to something that's coated in clear glass um, by all accounts. Other than that, any of this glass here is used for drinking or smoking, for sure. Well, um, you would think... Hold on, I gotta sneeze. <coughs> Man. Excuse me. Oh, where was I? You would think anything you could smoke or drink, you could also... Right, but use. when it comes to the... Like I said, very... <laughs> Very uh, argumentative world of glass dildo making. I don't know. There's not a standardized place, so I haven't really uh, made any yet. But um, yeah, it's uh, as far as these things go, um, the way that they make these colors is, like I said, through metal dust, through like uh, oxides. And when you uh, hit the hit the glass with a mixture of oxygen and propane, you determine what the color is going to be and like what, how much of that is brought to the surface, how much is burned away. Um, so when it comes to that kind of thing, yeah, I, I could see it being dangerous to a certain point internally. But once you have the, uh, you know, once it's cooled and annealed and everything like that, um, there's nothing on the surface. Uh, so it's academic more than anything. Mm. There's not going to be, I don't think, a National Dildo Association rating, you know, safeties anytime soon. Yeah. But um, as far as everything here goes, absolutely safe. And how but long have you been doing this? One year... Uh, in four weeks, so That's it? eleven months. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pretty good for. I've been putting time year. in. Um, yeah. This this style here. I don't know if anybody can see, but this is called uh, wigwagging. When you take a um, a straight line tube and you go back and forth in different spots and you make this zigzag pattern, this is a, a little bubbler kind of thing I shaped but never finished because I was like, this is too pretty. I don't want to ruin it. This almost <laughs> looks like a strange. Bong, huh? Right. I mean, theoretically, yeah, I could just put a grommet in there and make the most awkward little tiny bubbler in the world. Very fascinating. How many pieces have you made? Do you know? I have... Whew, I don't know. I've made a lot. I have a lot of scrap glass I need to do something with. Um... Because every two months I'd be like, look at what I made. This is so cool. And then a month later, it's the same thing with the with the, with the music. It's like... Oh no! What have I done? I gotta put. I gotta, I gotta take those pictures down. <laughs> what am I? <laughs> what am I celebrating here? Yeah. But no, progress is very good. Um, and something like this I made a couple months ago, or within the first few months of starting. Um, and then something like this, or like this, takes a lot more intricacy and like patience. And honestly, yeah, this is cool. This pattern is wild. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing, like, in the back of, like, cannabis culture in high times, these patterns in glass and being like, how the fuck did they make them? And just being fascinated. And this was the first piece I made where I'm like, wow, I'm a real, I'm, I'm really fucking, I'm doing glass That's here. cool. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these things, it's almost like I wouldn't even want to do anything with them. They're like kind of a work of art. And that's what's great about um, American Borosilicate is I've, I've, they're hardcore. Um, it, People don't realize it, but that's why I know it seems kind of silly. And some people out there are going to be like, that's the most insane thing I've ever heard. And I've gotten that from some of the groups I've posted in. But making glass um, impact weapons, um, like the martial arts training weapons and styling performance weapons, like I'm afraid to spin the Boro weapons because the only thing that's going to stop it is concrete. Like it's going to, if I get hit in the head, like if I get hit in the head with my metal dart, it's going to cut me maybe. And it's going to, I might crack my head maybe. But if I get hit in the head with a solid Boro sphere, I, I'm afraid I'm going to end up in the hospital really hardcore. Like, yeah. so it's, 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 um, it's as hard as brass. When a solid uh, one inch sphere, that's what I've read in a, in a um, scientific paper. Hmm. So theoretically, yeah, um, 
<laughs> I'm going to try it. We'll see. I'm actually doing some drop tests. I, I've been putting it off, but I want to just take like a Mythbuster style, like just take a yardstick and just drop it on asphalt, concrete, like pavement, just see whether a solid, you know, two or three inch uh, borosphere will crack or not. And it's really up in the air right now. Hmm. Nobody's done it. So I'll try it. So glass, drawing, fashion, music. Yeah. Any other creative endeavors you're part of or pursuing? Uh, see, I feel like these kind of conversations, long form conversations are necessary because when I meet somebody and they ask me what I do and I tell them all I, oh, I do, I do glass and also I do martial arts stuff and also I do art and also I have a clothing line and also <laughs> I did a, I have cannabisconsult.org. I started a cannabis consultation thing that I read at all the, I started writing reviews and started, um, like how to teach old, older folks how to smoke and stuff like that. Cause I have a lot of people coming <laughs> to, uh, you know, Teaching people in their 50s and 60s about cannabis for the first time is, is very interesting. I do it on, the da on a daily basis. So, And they're always asking me, is there any resource or anything I can look up? So I'm just like, I'm, I'm kind of in the process of writing a How to Smoke for Old People <laughs> website. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I want to get involved in, uh, in the flow arts thing more. I'm a member of the Oakland Chamber of Commerce. I want to approach them about having a fire spinning thing at something. I want to be in the uh, farmer's market there of all things. What, what, what made you want to be a part of that chamber of commerce? Um, commerce. It just seemed like a smart thing to do. I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to become more official with all my business stuff. And like, I'm trying to make that transition from artist to artisan um, to where it's not just, I guess, I like spending my time on the frilly stuff and I like spending my time on just raw creation and experimentation but I also, um, I don't know, I, I guess I want to be involved in the community. I don't know. Yeah. I guess I am searching for community. I, um, <laughs> when it comes to that, like, yeah, that's most of my creative endeavors. Uh, a big aspect, I guess, of my life that um, has also been affected by has been, like, spirituality and religion and that kind of thing. Um, I actually, <laughs> it's a deep dive, but... Um, I'm kind of still looking for a church, I guess. I'm looking for a religion or a faith. I don't know. Really? I've, I, yeah. Um, <clears throat> not necessarily because I'm searching for, I don't know, uh, any particular thing, but because it seems like, I don't know, that's how people connect with their community around them. Um, and I would like, I have had such a bad experience with Catholicism and Christianity from that aspect that I went in the opposite direction for a very long time um, and learned a lot about like left hand path magic and like a lot of like American like rebellion against Christianity and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm at a point where I may continue with that and, you know, join some kind of organization like, um, you know, the, the Church of Satan in Colorado is a good point of reference of, like, left-hand path or, like, non-traditional organizations that are still community-based and still bring a lot of uh, support and what I think Christians should recognize as Christian values to the community. Um, there's a lot of, um, I don't know, there's a lot of Christian folks that they are not Christian because they like to be nice to their neighbors and they like to be nice, be nice to the people they don't agree with, but because it makes them feel better than the other people. It makes them feel like in the same way that, I mean, my family grew up as very economically, you know, lower class, but um, they still had that streak of racism that the South side of Chicago has nurtured for generations, you know, that. Forever. Uh, that, yeah. Um, the idea, and I think it was, it was Reagan who said it and allegedly he wasn't, rubbing his hands together and laughing, he was just commenting on the state of the world, but he was like, if you convince the highest or the lowest white man that he's better than the highest black man, he'll pay you anything. He'll, he'll empty his pockets for you. Um, and it's, he said that? Reagan, yeah, who's quoted as saying that. It was either Reagan or Nixon. I'm pretty sure it was Reagan because there was a big like, and he wasn't go gloating. He, <laughs> there was like part of the quote I read was like them saying like, he was just saying, he wasn't saying it was good. Like, but uh, it, it's it's fucked. Um, yeah. 
And it's fucked up. that, uh, and a lot of people, a lot of Christians I see use their Christianity as a means of being like, well, God loves me. If those guys, if those heathens do their shit together, you know, God would bless them too. So it's their fault that they have their, you know, it's the same shit that like, I was taught that the Pharisees did to Jesus, you know, yeah, in it's Catholic a, it's school. It's a, um, 2000 year old pissing competition. It really is. I that I have be. no part of and never will. Because I grew up with that too. Yeah. And there are so many good values that come out of all religions because there are so many good values that come out when people come together to try to survive. Yeah. It has nothing to do with uh, a god, a yeah. monotheistic religion or a polytheistic right. religion. It doesn't really matter what the point is. The point is people try to survive. And when you hurt somebody in your group, no one wants to be around you. Yeah. Has nothing to do with God or heaven or hell. Right, right. Humans want to live, so therefore if you murder, rape, steal, uh, do any type of damage, no one wants to be around you. So we came up with these laws. These laws are natural. These are natural laws to for surviving. It yeah. has nothing to do with the God. And once you put on the money and the and the and put on that face, that guilt trip, that constant guilt trip, no sex before marriage, don't be over the world, don't you know the, well, the original sin? There's just there's something wrong with you to begin with. Yeah, That's yeah. Fine. Don't yeah. be a homosexual, even though yeah. it doesn't say that anywhere. But yeah, yeah. There's a lot of mis misinterpreted words, even going from Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrew to Greek. Yeah. You know where it went from Hebrew translation to Greek. It went from. A young woman to a virgin, which is not at all what's supposed to be in the Bible. And that's been misinterpreted millions of times. And that's that's another thing that really, really bugs me about all, I guess, Abrahamic faiths, but Christ, American Christianity in, in particular, that, like, that's Allah is not God. Allah is Allah, and we have God, and they have Allah. And it's like, dude, it's you it sound you sound like Star Wars nerds arguing about which sequel is better. Yeah. It's like it's all the same guy. It's like it's That's literally it's part three of your book. <laughs> it's the newer testament, and it's okay if you don't want to call it the newer testament, but that's what it that's what is the storyline, yeah. you know? Um and it's so strange to me that like all of the whether it's Allah or your Yahweh or Jehovah, it's like it's all my version is better, and so these guys are assholes. And it's it's so strange. It's really um, it's really hard. It's bad. I can talk about it forever. I grew up extremely Christian, and it's rough. It's a rough one. I don't know why people need to associate it with so badly, why they can't find meaning within themselves and those around them. Like, why you even feel the need to, like, join a church? Like, why not? I don't not? feel like I need to join a church. I'm, I'm very interested in the uh, psychology behind it. My... I have a godmother. Um, she's a very nice lady. She's very supportive. Um, but she also feels like, to a certain extent, that even though she is very committed to making sure I'm okay and healthy and taken care of, she also has this priority that I get Jesus in my life. Mm -hmm. I've, I like Jesus. I really do like the story of Jesus from an objective perspective as I recognize. I, I really identify with Jesus' sense of antinomianism, of his rebelliousness against, you know, what seems like capitalism back in the day, but at the same time, um, I got some bones to pick with God, I feel like, and I, I just can't... And I don't Jesus know. is God, so what right, do you Right, and that's weird, and like, like, I just don't like the whole, like, in the New Testament, like, God is this narcissistic, psychopathic parent that kills his son in a horrific way to prove a point, and that's all I, that's all I hear when I get into, like, those conversations about the Bible, is, I, I don't know, it's like... Um, uh, I, I don't mean to trash the Bible. I'm so sorry. No, trash it. I'll trash it with you. <laughs> I, uh, the New Testament is sweet, but the Old Testament's really fucking mean. Is the New Testament sweet? I mean, if you ignore, if you just glean the sweet parts out of it, if you, if you really look at it, if you squint and pretend to ignore the bad parts, it's okay. But I think the sentiment, the, the, the Christ message is something that, Everyone from Satanists to Setians to pagans to whoever can appreciate and see the value of in a modern day society, and that is to treat everyone how you want to be treated. Treat mm -hmm. treat everyone with these basic human decency and respect that they're trying to do the next right thing, and stop accusing everyone of being evil. <laughs> I don't know, like just because someone goes about life differently or sees the world differently or sees God differently doesn't mean that. 
you are wrong. It just it's it strikes an incredibly like insecure place when you're like the world's falling apart because not everyone believes in the God I believe. I don't know. Like forever is. not everyone has believed in the same God as you. No, yeah. In fact, forever there was no God until people started making them up. Yeah. But that's why I got sorry, I got uh, I started reading Anton LaVey, uh pretty pretty have you ever heard or have you ever read his work? I have not. Anton LaVey started the American Church of Satan in the nineteen sixties, um, on the West Coast and in, in um uh California. And it was more of a like joke religion. It didn't really um uh worship uh Satan. It was more like Satan as like a a mascot or like fun character. Yeah. Um <laughs> He was a lion tamer before that. He was he was a con man essentially. And I feel like all all religious people, all cult starters, all performers, magicians, are to an extent a con man. I don't know. Is Penn and Teller are they con men? Uh, they say they're magicians, so it's okay. You know what I mean? But, uh, was uh, Joseph Smith the guy that started the Mormonisms? He was outright. Uh, he stole fucking treasures from Indian places and sold them. You know, he was as close as you can get to a con man uh, without being convicted for one, you know? Yeah. Um, and he started the American Christian religion that to this day is still, we have, a vi- we almost had a vice president. We had a vice president, I think. Or somebody was running for president that's a Mormon. Mitt Romney? Yeah, yeah. He didn't win, but. No, but, um, yeah. So, yeah. and that's all from like 200 years ago of like a guy making shit up. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I've, I've, I've studied a lot of religions. I've gone really deeply into it as much as I have, I guess, um, music or like anything else, because I feel like when it comes down to it, um, I guess it comes down to, to, to the ultimate truth. And that's what the Sikhs refer to as death. You know, the ultimate, um, it's, it's something we all got to go through. We all got to face at some point. And some people ignore it and some people, uh, vouchsafe in Jesus. And some people say that like it's, it requires more work. You know, after that, it requires preparation to, you know, some people say you don't re- retain consciousness. It's just black. That's it. You forget your sleep. Some people say that you retain consciousness, you know, and what do you do then? Um, well, I, I'm under the guys and believe that since we don't know, yeah, like why am I, what am I, I should worry about what I can at least see, and right. feel. Right. And you can argue, well, how do you know? It's, is it a simulation? Why? Yeah. It's like, I don't know, but I'm speaking. Right. And it's being recorded and I'm talking or right. I'm not being recorded. I'm still speaking and thinking and making love and making food and growing and yeah, absolutely. and getting hurt and I get cut and it heals. Like that's still happening. So yeah. why am I worrying about something I can't do anything about mm-hmm. like at all? I can prolong it by living healthier. Yeah. I'm a big proponent of just being happy. Absolutely. Don't hurt anybody. Be kind. Be happy. Like I, what else? Do you, what else do you want? That's yeah. what every religion preaches. It is, and I, it's it's what it's what every religious fanatic ignores. It's um, there's a fascinating book I recently read, written by a Turkish psychologist called All Tomorrows, and it's a pamphlet. It's only like fifty, sixty pages, um, and it's a body horror in a million times worse than. Kafka's metamorphosis and it's about like the story of humanity a billion years in the future and how we've diverged and turned into different species but we've still retained our humanity throughout them all and we're not going to be here in a billion years <sighs> no way we're, I, there's no way I, I think that and I'm okay with that I'm okay with that too I really I be am. here either no I'm not going to be here in, eight, uh, in 90 years fucking but um, it's well, well, uh, I'm going to be here in 90 years. 90 you're going to be I'll be 121 120, yeah Easily. One of those Adidas jumpsuits. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I don't know. There's there's a lot of, uh, I think, where occult and science converge, where religion and, like, physics and psychology converge, that's, like, what religion has to become. We have to, um, we have to move past the superstition and, like, if, I don't know. And that's why, I like, um, I discovered Michael Aquino through reading about, um, the church Satan and stuff. He was, he's a, he's a very controversial figure in American history. Um, but he was a Lieutenant commander, um, in the army. He started the psychology, psychological warfare division. He, um, he later, uh, he worked for NORAD for space command. He, um, 
he was the head of the NSA after 9-11. Um, former, you know, member of the Church of Satan. He destroyed it essentially through lawsuits because he didn't agree with Anton LaVey anymore. And he started his own organization called the Temple of Set where he went and he like went to Egypt and he like traced like the the old roots of like rebellious religions back to the worship <laughs> of Set in Egypt like 7,000 years ago. Um, and yeah, and now he's living as royalty in Scotland. So if there's anybody, I don't know, it's crazy. Um, a crazy, crazy life filled with a lot of controversies and, and conspiracies. And um, But just reading behind like the philosophies of that and like the, uh, I don't know, the idea of like human curiosity and human intelligence and, and human perseverance are like the most they're amongst the most important core concepts to to value, um, that you have to become better than something you were. And I, I feel like that really resonated with me. And if I were to find a religion that combines the, the gumption and positivity of, of, you know, the exaltation of the self and the exaltation of, like, whatever god force there is out there that you go to when you die um i'd like that i'd like that kind of religion but so far the left hand path and the right hand path um and those phrases meaning like to me the left hand path religions are like when you die you you're your own person you 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 have your own focus you have your own ability to control what goes on when you on the right hand path religions they're generally like buddhism like hinduism christianity where you're subsumed by the godhead you stop being you um and it's it's strange and and i don't know thinking about death and trying to you know i guess grieve for the death of others is a big part of it too you know you want to know what happened to the people you love um and I think that's where a lot of people go to religion, where a lot of people go to to Christianity is that they need to know that their mom was okay or that their dad is okay, you know? And that's, I don't know. To a certain extent, there's a lot of people that say that's good. And to a certain extent, I think it's good. Even if you have to lie to yourself, you got to deal with the day. You got to get through the day and don't kill yourself, you know? Even if you got to pretend that there's a guy talking to you that loves you very much more than everyone else. Uh, but at the same time... Why, why is that a good thing? That's a lie. It's, it's you know... It's, why can't you just be honest with yourself? I mean, like, I love my mom and dad. They lived life. They're no longer here. Yeah. I must live my life and I will no yeah. longer be here. Yeah. What's so wrong with that? Yeah. I think I think that that's... Focus on now. Absolutely the best thing you can do. Yeah. I think it is. And and there's maybe, nothing wrong with... Maybe all of it is, um, you know, a result of mental illness, of our inability to cope with our, 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 uh, our control over time, mm -hmm. our ability to differentiate the past and the future and the present. And I, I made this, uh, you know, observations. My, my girlfriend, Kendall... Um, she's, she's great. She, uh, she made the observation, like you, you need to live in the present. Like you keep getting lost in the crazy and that's what a lot of people is. And that's what I guess PTSD is, is like remembering, uh, bad things that happened that you had no control over or, um, anxiety is living in the future and not knowing how you're going to work out a problem. Um, and I think you're a hundred percent right in that living in the, in the moment being here, um, is the best way to be happy and the best way is the only way that you can like relax. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Most of, uh, most of my problems come from that, from just like <laughs> spiraling over things I have no control over. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of people have that. And I feel like, um, <clears throat> when do you find yourself truly living in a moment? The rope dart. Rope dart. Rope dart. When I'm, making glass when I'm, you know, doing something difficult enough to where I can't have background <laughs> noise in my head. Yeah. You have to focus on something. And that's where, like, the idea of flowing, the idea of, like, um, allowing yourself to be lost in the moment and in, in playing and something that we lose fundamentally as adults. We Having fun. If, yeah. Just, just the act fun. of play. Yeah. Um, it's difficult. Humor. Uh, be goofy. Yeah. yeah. Laugh. I feel like... I feel like I've lost some of my humor 
I used to be an improv in college. I used mm. to be goofy. I used to be very talkative. And now I guard my words. I, I, I really, because I've so many times in my life <laughs> stepped over my own words and, and said things I shouldn't have, I'm very circumspect when I give my opinion now. And I feel like a lot of people are going to hear this and they're going to be like, Jesus, I didn't even know <laughs> any of this. Like, um, so I feel like... Uh, well, there's nothing yeah. wrong that you have said or I've said. No, no, it's all, um, yeah, it's all positive. And I, like I said, I, I really do. The only reason I gave that disclaimer about the uh, my work situation is that the system's broken, and I feel like the people I work with they're underpaid. And you mentioned like the arts and creativity, and half of the people I work with are artists or have graphic design degrees or some kind of creative degree, and rather than being paid for what they love to do. They're working this retail job for what should be minimum wage, um, you know, uh, almost being taken advantage of. You know, we have these folks from corporate come in and they see the signs that these people have made. And they're like, oh, this is great. We want all the stores to be like that. It's like if you want all the stores like that, you've got to hire graphic designers and you've got to pay them for their work. Like, I, I don't know. Like, it's difficult to see um, – what I, uh, what I imagine is a microcosm of everywhere in America right now of young, hardworking, talented Americans not being able to get a well-paying enough job in, in their chosen field and having to work retail and being called essential workers because people that are well off enough to not work don't want to work. And that's what it comes down to. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad. I think that everyone working there should be... I mean... <laughs> It's a lot. The, the medical cannabis industry is making so much fucking money. And I know people. I know people that have come in that have put up $40,000 for a license and not heard anything back from the state. And I know people who have, you know, tried to get a, a craft license and haven't heard anything back from anyone. And all of these rich people that are already millionaires are getting the licenses to print money. And it's beyond fucked. And it makes why me, is that? Why it is it makes so me hard? Gross to go into work sometimes. Why is it so hard? Um, why can't it be like a liquor license? You open up your shop because of these 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 puritanical people that think that we're trying to sell it to kids or some shit. They think that if we are able to get an eighth for for twenty dollars, then it's going to be all over the street. When they don't like to acknowledge the fact that keeping these prices so high is driving people away from the stores. Don't they already know it's all over the street? You think, yeah. Do you think I buy weed from Windy City Cannabis? I went into a BP the other day, and I laughed, and I'm not going to blow up their spot, but I, I almost took a picture to show my coworkers because they're selling bags in the BP at the corner by my house of, like, those fake, like, they have the California sticker on it, and it's, like, Crunchios, Weed Nuggets, and it's, like, those, like, brand, off-name brands. Synthetic weed? Or? No, it's an empty bag for you to sell weed. Oh. They're selling empty Ziploc bags with the logos at the BP for 75 cents each or two for a dollar. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. The FDA regulates food and drugs. The alcohol, you know, is regulated by the um, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, ATF. These things are regulated, DEA. Everything is regulated by these federal agencies. Do the same with marijuana. When you go into a liquor store, you can have a range of prices from lowest quality bottom shelf in a plastic bottle right. all the way up to some fancy $300 bottle in a glass in a cardboard yeah. box to behind more glass that a person who works and needs a key to open up. Right. When I went to Denver, they had the same thing. They had super cheap stuff from $15 all the way up to $150, like a spectrum, and you got to pick what you wanted, and a person came out with a key, opened it up for you when you needed it, when you didn't, answered any questions you had. They clearly smoked a lot of weed. Yeah. They knew what they were talking about. It's so simple. What are we doing here? For the listeners, um, uh, have you been to a medical dispensary in Illinois? I have. You have. Um, for the process, for a lot of people out of state are really surprised by it. Um, you have to go in and you don't get to see any of the products. You just get to see an iPad, an iPad menu. And we'll help you out with all the questions you have. But we're not allowed to open the product. It is sealed in a, in a package in a vault. And we are not allowed to show you the package until you're ready to purchase it. Um, you answer all your questions, you place the order on the iPad, and then you go in the back to the register where you actually make the purchase and exchange. Um, and just the fact that 
Sometimes we'll get half ounces that are completely empty, uh, 100% empty, just bare, no dust. Um, and people will be like, what is this? And it's like, sometimes we'll get um, stuff that's moldy. We've had to return stuff that's moldy. Um, and the fact that the law says you cannot open the container and there's no law that says that the container has to be clear is insane. Um, that's one insane thing. The fact that the, the edibles are limited to 100 milligrams uh, a jar uh, and the jars are $30 a piece when the dosage pre-taxes pre when the, the RSO guy says you got to take 2,000 milligrams a day that's God, that's $300, $600 a day for cancer treatment allegedly so I mean it's just insane yeah you, you walk to, into Joel Osco yeah and as you walk in one side is lined with chips yeah the other side's got sodas or Oreos and when you leave there's candy everywhere Sugar, fake crap everywhere, yeah. non-organic materials in here, wrapped in plastic, um, preservatives up the wazoo. You can go to the liquor section, buy whatever liquor you want, perfectly labeled, sealed. You know what you're getting. It has the alcohol percentage content. It has everything about it. It has warnings on it. You're educated on it. We all know what happens when you drink too much alcohol. Pregnant right. women shouldn't drink it. You can't drink and drive. Right. But for some reason, I still have to text somebody if I want to go buy weed because <laughs> right. it's a fourth the price. Or I got to be like, I hope I, I can't talk about weed in here. This person might not be cool. Or like this person might judge me or something. And I feel like the cannabis closet is a real thing. And not to say that like, not to compare it to the actual, you know, closet where people have been persecuted mercilessly across time and, and, and region. But, um, I think like there is a there's a thing called the cannabis closet where I get older people that are like they come in and they're very nervous. They're very nervous for their first time. I was nervous for my first time. I've gotten in trouble for cannabis for treating it for, for trying to use it to treatment myself before because I was, you know, and it's a very desperate thing feeling like a criminal. It is a very strange um idea um and it's it's kind of in that same uh vein as the 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 sin thing. It's like you're, you're, you're shaming people. Guilt, um, guilt, guilt. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with coming in and treating and getting cannabis to treat pain or to treat depression even. It's so much less detrimental to your health than alcohol. You had people who are religious drink alcohol all the time. There's people, and I know there's a couple people you've had on your, um, on your program before that are like, I can't do this because I can't be addicted to something and I can't, uh, you know, and there's some kind of like, I have to stay pure or whatever, this idea of like baseline, I have to be myself. And it's like, I would take the limitless drug in a fucking second. I would, I, I, I want to be the best person that I can be. And if smoking weed and I, I have ADHD, if taking Adderall is going to make me able to do all this shit, I'm going to do it all day. I don't care if it makes me, if you think that I'm a lesser person because it takes it, <laughs> I'm on... <laughs> I'm on Adderall and I'm on cannabis and I'm on steroids, essentially. That's what testosterone is. And I've been on the testosterone for six months and it's been a very strange second puberty, but um, I feel a lot better healthy. And I, I wanted to touch back on that because it's not about being aggro. It's not about getting laid. It's not about any of that stuff. People don't realize that your your uh, endocrine system does so much more than just does sex stuff. It oh, yeah. keeps you... It, at night, your brain, the way your brain breathes is all of your, all of your capillaries are set one way. So that's kind of, a lot of people theorize that when you sleep, that's your brain breathing and purging all that waste and shit out of it. And one of the things that really help with that is testosterone. It, it washes your brain at night. And that's one of the reasons, aside from like sleep apnea, why even after I got my sleep apnea fixed, it, my sleep didn't feel like sleep. And I, w I went 10 years without a good a night's sleep, and it really affects you. Yeah. It affects your heart. It affects everything. And if you feel like shit and you feel like you're worthless and you feel like there's something wrong with you, half of the time it's not and it's in your head, but it's worth getting checked. It's worth getting to see if there is, like, um, a chemical imbalance that's making you feel like that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times there is. A lot of times you're born yeah. with it. You know, sometimes Absolutely. you need... Help it might it might be a certain medication. Not everyone needs it. Sometimes it's promoted too much and have, push on people. Well, some people really do need it. Have you ever heard of Kleinsfelder syndrome? No. It's um, 
in the in that um, people with Down syndrome are born lacking a chromosome, uh, and I might be spelling this or pronouncing this wrong. Kleinsfelder syndrome is you get an extra chromosome, and so you have two X and a Y chromosome, so you are genetically trans. You are you are um, trans. So you are you have both two X's and a Y chromosome. You you possess all of the traits of both male and female genetically, and sometimes that shows more one way or another, and sometimes you can't tell at all. But the idea that people, like there's people out there, fundamentalists or evangelicals that say, you're either born a girl or you're born a boy, and God doesn't make mistakes. And like, God has clearly, there's a long history of people that are both male and female genetically and physically that... God has a lot of, <laughs> there's no mistakes. They are not mistakes as people. But I'm just saying to the people that claim that the, that any kind of um, sexual or physical, uh, you know, uniqueness is a fault of the bearer is, it's just another way for people to feel better about themselves, to shame others. And, yeah. and you know, there are no mistakes and like, I don't know. The idea that like this this desire to have a very very set strict definition of sexuality and gender in our society just seems very very desperate. It seems very like insecure. It, it seems like and I'm going to say this aside from sociopaths and psychopaths that are looking for a victim, I have never met someone who dislikes gay people that wasn't jealous in some way or like you know it came out later like oh those those gays with their big butts <laughs> you know and it's like it it's a religious out. thing too it is it is and it but i'm saying like i don't know there, there i guess there is i don't have hang out with enough religious people to get that i i guess to get the um just straight fanatic afraid of gay people for no reason um but yeah, it's 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 terrible. It, it's um, I don't know. It's it's something I really think that everyone, if they are Christian or whatever faith, or if you don't believe in a God at all, you know, like just let people be themselves and don't think that I don't know. Well, they think it's going to infringe on their values, yeah. uh, on the on the the law that it's becoming a problem that it's making. When you believe something is an inherent sin, yeah, any law that promotes that, you feel like it's going against what makes you who you are, what you grew up with. As if the past is a great representation of what is supposed to be. I mean, women have only been have they've only had the right for 101 years to vote. That's nuts. So like and people of color have only had the right for what? 60 years? You know, They're and doing their best to take it away. Yeah. But and Gay marriage has only been legal for, what, in the last six, seven years? I don't remember the exact time, but it's very yeah. recent. And they still don't have all the same rights. Um, they say there's a separation of church and state, yet a president gets called in the office, he puts his hand on a Bible, you go to a courthouse, you put your hand in the Bible. Yeah. It's on our tent legal tender. Yeah. Um, Pledge of Allegiance, it's in there. I know that these things are... Well, all the things you just said make me want to start a satanic church not long, but... <laughs> Why? Well, because that's the way to combat it. That's the way that you do separate church and state is that all of these people want the commandments on the front court, court, the courthouse steps. And if, well, I demand equal treatment. I want a Satan statue right next to it. And if they, and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want your religion in the court. It's like, you got you to gotta play fair, buddy. This is fucking America, yeah. okay? You got to abide by your own fucking rules. And if you want to make this... But now this it's a, just another religion. If though. you want to make this a theocracy, you say that. Don't say you're fighting for freedom when you just want your own stuff out there. But then now it's just another religion that's getting into the government, and not separation of church and state. That's true. But when... <laughs> and the reason why I got out of the Church of Satan is because... You can only accomplish so much with whoopee cushions and rebelliousness. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, like, what are you trying to build? And I think that there are a lot of people involved in that organization, a lot of people that are looking for some kind of organization in the same way I am that want to see, they, they want to see more creative, more empathetic, more responsible people in power. And, you know, getting involved in politics sucks. 
I don't want to get involved in politics. Mm -hmm. I'm almost certain you don't want to get in politics. Not even close. But if the people that don't want to get involved in politics don't do it, the people who want to get involved in politics are going to do it. And they're usually fucking monsters. They're usually getting into it because they want to have power, not because they want to be not they cannot because they want to do all the shit work that involves organizing happiness for other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and honestly, hot take. Um, As if there hasn't been enough. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump really opened up some doors for us, and I mean that in that like. You no longer have to be a politician to be a politician. You can be an entertainer. You can be a goddamn World Wrestling Federation champ in the Hall of He's in the He's Donald Trump is in the Hall of Fame of the World Wrestling Federation, if I'm correct. And was he a wrestler? He had a he had a surprise guest appearance where he he did something, I think. But <laughs> I'm not a wrestling guy. So you I just get to ran. go in the Hall of Fame just from having a guest appearance? Oh well, yeah, but if you're rich enough, I mean, he, wow. But I'm just saying, like, I mean, Ronald Reagan was an actor in the '50s. That's yeah, yeah. and so. and at the end of the day, like, it's opening the door for, like, if I'm gonna write a song about, and I, it's funny that I'm talking about God and everything, but I, I recently wrote a song called Deicide about how I want to <laughs> kill God, and like, it's it's a really intense little Nas style thing, and like, um, if I'm gonna put out something like that, have people still take me seriously and vote for me as maybe possible? I mean, if Donald Trump can do that shit with Stormy Daniels, and people still take him seriously and not throw him out of office, I feel like I can get away with being self expressive and being a genuine person, and people still. I don't know. Take me seriously. I, I I know it sounds very silly and very stupid coming from that angle of like the Donald Trump because I don't like him at all for uh, many reasons. But um, I don't know. We have to take advantage as as young, intelligent adults on the south side of Chicago. We have to take advantage and organize and make this area better, or it's going to be exactly like it's been for the last hundred years, which is gray and the weeds kicking out of the. <laughs> I just imagine a lot of racism, a lot sexism. of racism, and post-industrial decay, and yeah, people not living the lives they deserve to live. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm very grateful for. Um, I don't know if you uh, participate in politics at all, but Mary Newman, the congresswoman who got elected, uh, the alternative to her was this gentleman who thought that the reason that Donald Trump was great for America and that the only thing wrong with Cook County was too much abortion. So I feel like we really swerved on that that dick. Um, so And what was he running for? Uh, congressman mm. um, for Cook County or mm-hmm. whatever this area is here, district. But um, yeah, it's uh, for senator. I can't remember. I'm terrible with that. See, I'm not fucking good at politics, man. But I'm not either. I, I don't know. I'll admit that. I'm a, more of a lead by example type of person. Yeah. Trying to make a difference outside of religion and politics. Yeah. And maybe that's my, uh, maybe that's the lesson I need to learn from the last couple of weeks of exploring that is that I just need to focus on what I'm good at and not, uh, not try and take on the, uh, the problems of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. You make a difference in the small increments of what you're capable of, what's relative to your life. Absolutely. You know, um, I had a friend purchase, um, some glass for me and they said that their kids loved it and it was like the coolest thing they'd gotten and that was like the most heartwarming thing I'd done in like a long time Mm. um and that and like the uh doing the glass blow or doing the the fire spinning thing like that's something that no one dislikes no one dislikes fun lights like nobody anybody that does I don't want to be around that asshole like who's like I don't like I don't like this it's ugly. <laughs> like, who's going to come in here? I don't know. Like, to, I just, um, the pursuit of beauty and the pursuit of joy and the pursuit of harmony amongst others, I think, is here and now in the moment is the highest priority that uh, we can all have. And we need to remember to, to do the responsible stuff and do the self-care and do everything else. Um, we can't just be hedonists forever and not pay attention to anything, but um, more people need to let go. Um not necessarily let God, but, um, yeah, just, uh, try and live in the moment. Absolutely. I mean, that's been the only thing that I've noticed that works really well in my life has been expression, 
camaraderie, coming together to accomplish a bigger task other than yourself. It's not about money. It's not about God. It's not about politics. It's about being a decent human being and expressing yourself in a way that feels natural to you. It's harmless to others, but it can enlighten them. It could give them motivation. It can inspire. And it's the small steps. If you're happy as a person, then you'll probably push that through and show that happiness to other people. I mean, yeah. They'll get inspired and be like, oh, that was really nice. You know, it's where kids get it from. Like, if you just let a kid run rampant without the the view and, and the control of the parents, mm-hmm. bad thing happens. Like, really bad things can happen. Yeah. But if the parents are there, positive reinforcement, helping the kid out, helping them with homework, doing the best they can with what they have, it, it leads to a better society. You know, Absolutely. So, and to just make it about religion and about politics, about what other people tell you you should be doing, it leads to a lot of problems. It leads to homophobia, sexism, racism, xenophobia, pure ignorance of other religions and cultures. and, and Reality. Of reality. And that thing is, the, all those things are reality. Yeah. You should be aware of them enough to understand, like, if someone mm-hmm. has a different skin color and has a different religion, it does not make them lesser or a bad person. Mm-hmm. They could equally see the same thing in you. They're just from a different part of the world. Yeah. And over time, their skin is a different color because of melanin. It's very simple. Yeah. It's quite easy to understand. And their religion didn't make it to you. It made it to England where that English people came to America and pushed it here. Like it's not rocket science. Yeah. But because you get into that dogmatic thinking, you're afraid to go against that. It's it's hard to talk about it. It takes courage. It's to, yeah. it's um the kind of courage to be independent, to stand out, to be a target. Yeah. To make yourself a target. And it's very scary. Um, and that's part, I think, part of the reason why I have kept the music in turn, like where I haven't published much and I haven't been going out there. This is kind of the first step, I feel like, towards um, getting out there and getting promoting myself. And that's, it's difficult for me. That's why I, I contact you about, like, I need help. <laughs> I, need to, I need to promote, I need to, like, hire somebody to help me out here. Like, it's difficult for me to promote myself and be 100% confident in these things. You know, I feel like a lot of the reason why I make this stuff is that, um, you know, I, when I first transitioned from making music and all electronic things to I started doing wire wrapping and physically making stuff, I was reminded of like the god Hephaestus and like Vulcan, like uh, the idea of I don't know if you've studied the Greek gods, but um, it's the the Greek maker god, the the anvil god, um, who was like crippled and like. Uh, uh, ugly, but he was married to um, Venus, the the love goddess, and um, through his creations, he sought beauty and he sought to make something worthy. Um, and it kind of really resonated <laughs> with me that like I I don't like myself for the most part sometimes, and that's a toxic thing. And I try to be more positive, but like making these things, um, making beauty in the world, is a very uh, powerful, profound act that I I find rewarding in itself you know? these are beautiful yeah absolutely and the um oh these are that's cool too that necklace <laughs> i meant to show um some more guys here Oop. sorry about that no, you're caught on the headphones but, but yeah these are opals they're made in texas um but they compress borosilicate and it turns into a gem. So you didn't you can, make this? Oh, I made the whole thing, but I'm just saying the little jewels inside oh, okay. them, themselves. <laughs> For those listening, it's a necklace with two eyes and a nose. It's orange and yellow with opals inside. Opals. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's um, making things of beauty. Um, I don't know, it just makes sense to me and it's such an... A world that is often characterized by ugliness. So, yeah, I feel good about it. And and there's something profoundly rewarding every morning because I what I have to do is after I would do whatever work I'm doing, I put it in the kiln for 12 hours to cool down slowly. So every morning I work, it's like the next day, it's like Christmas. I get to go see these treasures I've made outside, and it's it's very <laughs> childlike wonder yeah. uh, every time. And and I. A year ago, if you told me I had made this, it's not even finished. It's just a blank. It's just this. This. This is what I call a wigwag, and I connected to another one. This is. I never would have imagined I could have made this, mm-hmm. or anything here. Um, so, getting out of your comfort zone, um, learning, learning things you never imagined you'd learn. Um, Being is, very open is, is the 
the core um, uh, the core goal of being human to me. Um, the same thing with like getting getting whaled in the nards with uh, with a with a one pound weight on the end of a rope is is painful. That's getting, happened getting, to you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you you hit yourself a couple times with the rope dart. I'm glad um, you said nards. Did you yeah, get that from the movie Monster Squad? Probably. <laughs> But, That's where I got it from. <laughs> uh, it's cultural zeitgeist. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and that was one of the fears I had when I first saw somebody doing poi when I was 21 or 22. I was like, that looks really fun, but you're going to hit yourself. It's going to hurt. And I don't know, through five years of just kind of like breaking myself down and having a terrible time as a human <laughs> and, and finding like the end of the road where like uh, suicidal ideation lies and where it, it, start, it stops... Uh, being healthy at all, um, you know, I, uh, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I feel like you find um, you can't make any more excuses. You have to do the the pain of a burn, the pain of uh, getting kicked in the nuts, the pain of I, I broke my toe once, I think, with a rope dart because I was angry and I was practicing barefoot and I was being stupid as fuck, um, but none of that compares to what it feels like to waste your life, to be 80 and be like, what have I done with my life? Absolutely. That's the biggest thing I've heard from yeah. anybody old. Yeah. No regrets. Do not have regrets. And that's why you got to, you got to pursue things that might seem dangerous, that might seem scary, that might seem not profitable. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, I, know that I one. <laughs> have lost a lot of money blowing glass. I not have, a sentence I hear every day. <laughs> I have invested in this because if I keep doing it every day, I'm hoping to be able to sell $1,000 pieces, $2,000 pieces. There's people on the West Coast and in California making these elaborate, huge pieces that they put 30 hours into, 40 hours into, hundreds of hours using this dichro shit and real gold and real stuff that the half-life of borosilicate is a million years. That's it? It's... <laughs> It's going to be around forever, uh, essentially, longer than we can comprehend. Yeah. Um, and that, to me, is much more, uh, I don't know, I guess much more fulfilling than just one show at Shuba's or something, you know? That's, a, that's living in the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know. I, I do miss performing quite a bit, but it's a different buzz. I don't know. It's a different thing. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to continue progressing and see where I can go and uh, start selling glass. I got to sell some glass. Yeah, um, no, it's very cool. You should, um, you should try to sell some at DZ Fest. I would love to. At come. the art Absolutely, tent. yeah. Yeah, it's going to, I mean, I usually 20 artists a day selling artwork, so. Actually, the person that got me into it, um, not, I guess the person that inspired, inspired me was I saw Robert Banks. Um, with an S Banks um, live glass blow at a dispensary in <laughs> Mokina or something like that, mm -hmm. Mantino. Uh, but uh, yeah, he uh, he was blowing glass in the lobby, and I was like, "What the like? How the hell do you even do this?" And uh -huh. he explained it all, and I was like, "Wow, that's not not so that's that's a lot cooler than he was doing the lamp work. He wasn't doing like the whole propane forge thing." Um, and uh, that was the first time I'd ever seen anyone blow glass in any way um and it stuck with me and when i was getting into the dispensary as a day job and i was like i want to get into the cannabis industry but i don't want to grow weed because it's all fucked and i can't get the license and um i realized the glass is going to explode in the next five years here um glass is so huge on the west coast and in denver um and this is one of the last this is one of the only 100 percent american art forms all of this was made in america all of these things were invented in America by American chemists in the last hundred years. Um, China is desperately trying to catch up to this stuff, and all their glass sucks. Do you know the history of glass blowing? Like, it, it's got to predate America. Oh, by far, the Egyptians were the first ones. Yeah, to I was going to say it sounds like a very old art they, form. They, they, to do this wigwag thing requires an immense amount of very focused heat that is really only accomplished these days through jet torch technology. So the fact that the uh, Egyptians were able to make a basic wigwag at all. And they did. It's like in some museum somewhere. It's like 3,000 years old. Mm. It's insane. Yeah. Do you know how they did that? 
I'm I'm assuming some kind of specially made forge that focuses up to just a straight line of heat. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, nobody knows how they actually did it. Um, wow. But and it requires a level of engineering and science that people don't believe existed back then. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, most of it comes from. I feel like the Western side of things comes from Italy. Uh, Murano is where all the old school glass forges are comparing Murano glass to soft glass from around the world is like comparing Chinese glass to American glass. It's like the original, the the OG when it comes to that kind of stuff, like sculptural glass, um, working in the forge. Um, but here in America, it started with, it started with the, the weed movement, honestly, all this stuff, the, the torch stuff, all of the, the petty borosilicate things that it comes from underground illegal glass blowers. I wish I had brought it uh, the bowl push, but uh, actually it's this little tool. It looks like um, it's a little uh, domed tip. It looks like a pencil with a little lead coming out. Um, It's made of graphite. And uh, it was illegal up until a couple of years ago to own a bowl push because it's the the thing you use to to push the bowl in, to keep the hole the, the right diameter and to push it in. And so the only people that have bowl pushes are pipe makers Mm. so to own a bull push for many years it was like having (laughs) i don't know it was like having a um a money printing machine or having like a crack pipe i don't know it's it's hard to say but um yeah it's uh there's a huge history of illegal glass blowing even as recently as 10 years ago, Operation Pipe Dreams, where they put Tommy Chong in jail. Um, the DEA like busted him for selling pipes on the internet. Um, it's, I think there's a certain state I'll never be able to send pipes to because of laws, um, because the, the DEA is based there. And, like, they, like, well, you don't smoke tobacco out of these? Right. Isn't um, that how they get away with selling it in stores? Yeah. I found so out that funny. you can't show the carb hole on Etsy. You sh- if you show the carb hole on Etsy in pictures, they'll take it down as a cannabis pipe. Oh, because you don't do that with tobacco? Mm-hmm. I didn't know. I don't know anything about this. Right, yeah. I but, don't really smoke tobacco, so I don't know. Right, right. Have you? <laughs> um, occasionally. I was a smoker for a long time, cigarette smoker, um, but I got out of it, honestly, and I'm Good. really glad I did. When, when did you smoke? To and from? Oh, Jesus. This is going to be like... I feel like this is going to both date me and make people feel like I'm sketchy, but like 14 to like 26. Sounds about right. Yeah. Most people um, start smoking before 18. Yeah, for it's sure. It's not really, no offense people, but it's not really an adult thing to start doing. Right. You get to a certain age, you're like, I don't know. It's bad for you. I start. But when you're right. immature enough to not understand the ramifications, is usually <laughs> when people start. That's what I've noticed. Teenage yeah, years. Absolutely. So maybe 14 is a little bit on the younger side these days. Mm-hmm. But I'd say that, yeah, 16, 17, 18. Well, especially I was a little bit more rural than here. And yeah, like, that's different too. Packs, packs of cigarettes were 4 or $5. I mean, it was a different world when it comes yeah. to tobacco. So I would never do it now though. Yeah. I, it's, it comes down to like it's not a fun drug. And that's what, honestly, <laughs> there's a lot of people are going to be like, well, that's not a good reason to get sober. But alcohol stopped being fun. Alcohol wasn't fun for me anymore. I don't know if it's because my liver stopped being as effective or because I just wasn't enjoying it anymore. But like the euphoria, the whatever that I enjoyed from doing alcohol for whatever amount of time, it stopped getting that. It stopped doing that. It stopped being enjoyable. I had to find better drugs. And honestly, if that's if you're struggling with addiction or struggling with something, Find a better drug. And I know that seems, uh, there's so many, like, and I think this goes along with, like, the cold turkey, puritanical, like, guilt side of, like, the Midwest. But, like, I grew up and my family was very into AA. Very, like, no drinking, none of that. That's evil. Um, And there's a lot of that in the AA culture where if you find out that someone smokes weed or if you find out that someone does something anything at all that's psychoactive in any way it's like oh you're a drug addict i got it there's there's like this holier than thou thing where alcoholics feel better than junkies and whatever you got what kind of phrasing you have to use to feel better about it and uh i was that way for a while i i really didn't like people on heroin you know when i was a drunk um and that to a certain degree justified things in my own sick head and you can't think of things like that you can't you can't put yourself on a pedestal because of other people's suffering. And that's, that's a really um, common thing I see in, in people around me. In people. And like I was mentioning about evangelical Christians do that a lot. Um, Absolutely. But a lot, of, a lot of alcoholics I know, know of 
on the cusp of it, we'll always be like, well, so-and-so does it more. Right. They instantly blame, yeah. like shift the blame. And that's that's a narcissistic thing. That's and And I don't think anyone I've grown up with, any, any of my parents or any of my relatives were like, clinically narcissistic to the point where they're missing a part of their brain and they can't understand empathy. Yeah. Um, but definitely like the culture and the family like values and stuff is definitely, it's, it's just the whole, I feel like a lot of cultures and families have that narcissistic streak of like, um, you've, you've got to, everything you do is a reflection of the family. It's like, you got to live your life for the family. You don't get your own life. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I get that a lot from, um, uh, Hispanic friends and things like that have very like close knit mm -hmm. family ties. That's like you got to stay here and take care. Like I took care of my grandparents because they were the best, the most supportive people I've ever had in my life, um, and because I love them and because I wanted them to be taken care of. If I had been in a family where it's like you got to take care of grandma and grandpa, and the grandma and grandpa's like, "Why aren't you taking care of me?" And <laughs> like, they're dickheads. Fuck you! I'm yeah. out of here. What if they're not nice. Yeah, what I don't give awful. a shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. But <laughs> so that's why people are like you're so good. It's like I wanted them to. I wanted my grandparents to be okay. I was selfish about it. I didn't. You know. I, right. But still, at that age, a lot of people still wouldn't. Have yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know many people who do that. So. Yeah. Um, no, it's um, it's a, it's definitely a big guilt thing of well, we want grandchildren. Yeah. Like, why aren't you married? You right. know how many times I've heard that? Yeah. I'm like 31. It's like. I don't want that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, eventually, I just, right, I got, just I'm right doing now, things. Like, I've got priorities, yeah. I'm doing things. I'm mm -hmm. doing things I enjoy. I'm happy. Yeah. I chose a path that takes a little bit longer to get established, but it's, it's I enjoy it more than a lot of people might enjoy things. And that's just from hearing them complain about it, you know? Yeah. I had a guy come in uh, to the cannabis store um, just complaining about his life. It was sad. He's like, I make, I make, I want to take a day off. I haven't had a day off in 200 days. I don't, and he was just talking about, he's like, yeah, I run a, I run a construction company downtown. It's like, and it's like, why don't you just like, I have somebody work for you. It's like, it's $110 an hour. How, how can I, how can the fuck can I do that? Uh, it's like, dude. You need to go to Burning Man. You need to fucking drop out for a week. You need to fucking, you need to find a reason to keep living. Yeah. Because you come into the dispensary to buy vapes and complain about how much you hate your kids and how fucking expensive your wife is and whatever you're going on about. You need to, you need to change some things, brother. A lot of people do. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people do. It's, it's very healthy to have yeah. a day, two days, a week to decompress. It's hard. It's hard when you're a busy person. You have a lot of things that rely on you. Yeah. If you're doing your own business or your own work or your own yeah. endeavor, it's definitely hard, but it is doable. You got to make it work. Yeah. And the, the longevity is key. And it comes down to self care. That's, uh, you know, treating your mental health is self care. You know, whether you accomplish that through something fun, something active, or just taking a bath alone, you mm -hmm. know, you've got to treat yourself. So, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Parks and Rec. <Rackness>. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to do that more and more. It, it's definitely hard. I, I did that this weekend, and I had a lot of fun. I had, like, for the first time in I don't know how long, at home, like a classic Saturday and a mm -hmm. classic Sunday where I just, like, did whatever. Yeah. And I didn't work on anything, and I, like, I hung out with some people. I went on, I mean, I go on walks every day, but, like, went on a longer walk Saturday. Mm -hmm. A seven a seven mile walk in the rain in the forest off the beaten path. We didn't take the normal path. That's really fun. It was really fun and just like relax. I think I took an edible and just I just did whatever. I think I watched a movie. Haven't done that in a while. And just did listen to vinyl, made yeah. dinner, hung out with people. Sunday I went swimming in a pool, went to a coffee shop, like didn't look at my phone that much. Just like did things and just yeah. like saw people I haven't seen in a while and like had conversations with them and it's like I'm so busy with the phone and the laptop you know their Apple products so they work hand in hand which is nice but then I'm using two computers at once day in and day out just like getting stuff done it's a slog it, yeah it's it's <clears throat> good work but you need to detach I'm like dude there's a, more things in life than work you know? absolutely yeah and I uh, I get lost especially doing this stuff especially like I have a tendency to binge on things um and it's very easy to go get lost in the garage over this torch for like six hours, eight hours, 
And now that I have, I bought an oxygen compre- or oxygen concentrator, so now I don't have to take a trip. I used to take a trip once a week with a 150-pound tank in my Toyota to get new oxygen because it only lasts eight hours in a tank this tall mm. for because uh, you go through so much of it with this torch. Um, and this is a small torch. This is like the second smallest you can buy. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, so now I can just go get lost in there forever. And um, that's great that I have that escape, that I can go do that. But also I can't just blow glass forever. I can't, even if like even if I wasn't, trying to run this as a business and build up other aspects of it than just my skill on the torch. Um, you know, I, I have stuff I need to focus on for my own life. I have, Absolutely. I have, I think I might have a crack in my roof. I need to fix. There's, there's all you this. You said you're awful. in a relationship. I'm in a relationship. That's I'm trying too. to build that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get out there and explore my, and, uh, uh, find a community, not necessarily, you know, whatever religious i know i'm kind of going off on the deep end with that shit these days but um (laughs) i was not expecting that no and i wasn't either because i had been going so deep uh away from christianity for so very long and i found i realized that i i kind of dislike christian i feel like if i need to be work on a better being a better person i can't have this this prejudice against christian christianity Mm. i don't know i need to work on being i i and it's I guess it's weird that I think that by being less Christian, it's going to be making me more Christ-like. <laughs> I don't know. How do you um, mean? Well, because when I hear Christianity, I think of American evangelical false Christianity. Like the I, just all of the things that about Jesus that are nice and wholesome and good aren't represented by people screaming about trans people and how they need to get out of the bathroom and how Donald Trump's the real. Pro- I don't know. It's just it seems completely antithetical to want people to be Christian more than they want them to be happy. Yeah. If being... Uh, no, it's a huge if, contradictory. If being a, a poly, gay, you know, trans, biracial, whatever, whatever uh, labels you want to attach negatively or positively to yourself, if that makes you happier, I think it's a very classically Christian thing to just let people be happy. And I think that... And by classic, I mean the year zero to the year 100 when Christians were persecuted for being weird cult members because they wouldn't they weren't cool with public executions i think that that's that's a very you know that's a very uh wholesome or a very genuine time to be a christian and past that it's literally just a billionaire kings and emperors praising jesus so that they can kill people on the battlefield better and that was what it was for two thousand years and i feel like that and the middle ages and the black there's so much there's so many things that have affected greatly humanity's perception of what god is and what right and wrong is that we are just a jumble of, of nonsense today in america it seems it's, like it's hilarious. it's so and you know i mentioned the mormons and like they're more of a left-hand path religion like they believe that when you die if you do the magic thing at the end right then you get your own you become a creator god and all your wives get to come serve you it's very weird and if it was not so misogynistic and creepy it would be really cool i'd be into it but it's like would you i don't I, the idea of based off what <laughs> that movie where you go to heaven and it's a robin williams movie and you get oh, to imagine what, what dreams stuff. May come? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of cool, but that's not Jesus Phil. I don't know. That's not what Christians think of when they think of heaven. I heaven doesn't even sound that great to be honest. It doesn't. I, I don't, don't want to go to heaven. I don't want to see it's everybody. As fuck. I it's, was trying my life to get away from these people. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Terry Pratchett is a is a fantasy writer and he has a very expansive funny series called Discworld. Um and it's uh it's very satirical, but I think he has it right in that whatever you believe wholeheartedly, whatever that whatever that function of the brain is that uh, that is faith or hope or you know willpower um, determines what you experience when you die. If you really believe you're going to be a ghost that is trapped here or whatever, if you really believe that and the function of your brain is doing that when you die, I think you might do that. I don't know. Um, if you believe you're going to a heaven. Your brain, it's kind of like dreaming. It's essential. A lot of people say that like death is the long dream. And if you don't master lucid dreaming, you're going to have a harder time. I don't know. And I don't know if you've ever lucid dreamed or like 
studied that kind of thing or um, <laughs> the CIA is scary when it comes to like um, what they've actually studied and like how they've broken down the barrier between electromagnetic resonance and like MRIs and what is consciousness and what happens after you die. Um, the Michael Aquino guy I mentioned did a lot of that research into like uh, breaking down the barrier between psychology and neurology and religion. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's, I've seen the inside of an MRI spin, uh, with the cover off. And I don't know if, uh, if we can accurately map the neurological pathways of our brain and like figure out, map our consciousness. Um, I don't think we ever can. I think we're going to hit, have you heard the, uh, oh, what's it called? Oh no. Um, It's not called the resurgence. It's it's when humanity hits a point where our computers are more powerful than the computing the power of our brains. The singularity, yes. Yeah. We're closely approaching the singularity, and I think it's going to happen. Some people don't think the singularity is possible. I think it happened, but that still doesn't give us an answer to consciousness. No, it just makes more players in the game uh-huh. with, with bigger guns. The answer to consciousness, is this, to me, is the same thing as the answer to everything. There yeah. isn't one. Yeah. But, well, it's sure fun looking for it. Yeah, and and th- I think that might be the function itself is you got to make your own. You got to make your own purpose. There's you been gotta, a million. Like yeah. you take 7.8 billion people, I guarantee you there's a couple hundred million different ways of looking at itself. You'll get some doubles, people yeah. who just literally have the same ideologies and beliefs. Right. But there's so many variables. There's yeah. so many religions. There's different upbringings. There's people who have seen death at a young age, there's PTSD, there's people who took mushrooms at 14, there's people who never took them. Yeah. There's people who drink, there's people who don't. There's different diets, different genetic mutations. There's, there's, it's endless. The combinations are all over the place, and that's what makes it amazing, that everyone truly is unique and different. You, you will not get the same person. Even identical twins are different. There's too many possibilities. The genetic mutations that happen, as far as even your blood and the hemoglobin in your blood. Like, there's so many variables from the smallest thing to the largest thing that even stars aren't the same, they, they, yet they still operate the same way with hydrogen combining to helium yeah. and so on, to carbon into iron and creating a core. Like, even those vary in intensity and the plasma and the temperature. And do they get big? Do they small? How, when do they collapse? When don't they? These variables are all around you. Yeah. And that's what makes it so amazing. Like, the randomness of it all. And it's it's so expansive and... It's so huge that it makes me think that there has to be something after death because I, I don't know. Uh, it might be like a cyclical logic, but or like just looking for an answer and nothing. But I don't know. Um, have you ever heard of dimethyltryptamine or studied that? Yeah. yeah the um, the concept of like the death molecule, the God molecule, and like what happens to your consciousness when you die, and that. Um, I kind of just, if I had, if someone put a gun to my head and say, what do you really think happens? Like, what's your faith or what do you think happens? What's your best guess? I, I would think that there's, there's like in the same way that there's an internet with our computers and stuff, there's some sort of like um, consciousness outer net that you can, that when you die, you can essentially like, where do you want to go? It's like, you can travel, you can explore, you can see the wildness of, of, everything of creation of a million million worlds that we can't imagine where it rains glass and it explodes fucking pink lava from trees and shit it's crazy <laughs> yeah um and uh i mean it's a shame if we don't get to see all that it is and maybe that's maybe that's uh acceptance that's that's part of living in the moment is knowing that you have to be grateful for what you got yeah. you're not going to get everything no so. it if if there was a god, yeah, why would he or she or it create something in, in its image, yeah, and plant in its DNA and maybe a little sprinkle of nurture someone who's six years old who thinks that the thought you thought that you mentioned <laughs> earlier about suicide? What kind of what is that? Why would an entity do that? That's pure evil. That's not that's not good. To be just just because. Yeah. Because there's always, the Lord works in mysterious ways, that's why. <laughs> right. Or, there is no God and things are just random. Or, there is a God and he's pretty darn malicious. Yeah. Or practical. I uh, 
have you ever studied or I, I shouldn't use the word study. Have you ever read or like learned a little bit about AI programming? It's not enough. The no. way we do it is that we have it. We have it. We teach programs um, death. We teach them like suffer. Like we 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 kill them until they learn out a way not to be killed, and then that is what's making them smarter. Is just opposition. There's no like pleasure circuits or anything we're building. There's nothing like that. It's literally just like problem solving through survival, um, and that's how we have developed the AI programs we have, um, and. If we're anything made in the image of God, maybe that's you know how He did it. I don't know if if we have if we have a pre-made creator or some shit. Whether that you believe in ancient aliens or you believe in <laughs> Jesus, whatever Himself. Um, yeah, it's like uh, just make them <laughs> poke at them until they dance funny, and like I want to. I'm, I'm looking for pretty stuff. But like, what's the <clears throat> what's the point? Like, what's the point in giving a five year old leukemia? Yeah. What's the point of someone? That's something being able I to... get hung up on a lot. Yeah. Why does that person get to live to 120? There's a phrase for it. Um, I don't think it's the Ophidian paradox, but it's something like that. It's a Greek guy that's like, if God is infinitely powerful, why does he make us suffer? Why is there suffering? And and you can go around it all the way and say he's trying to teach us, he's trying to do something for us, but at the end of the day, he's either all all powerful or he's really cruel. It's one or the other, and ultimatums are usually or, or powerfully wrong. cruel, or, or power. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think I identify the most of any of the gods I've heard of or anything with the um, maybe it's Navajo, but one of the ancient uh, or one of the, one of the native um, uh, tribes. See the uh, god is a is a trickster god is like a joker. It's like ah, gotcha. Uh, would, it, would it be um, Loki? Not Loki. That's oh. the that's the uh, Norse trickster god. Yeah. Um, but the I don't know if there's a name for it, but just like, um, yeah, just the idea that God's laughing. <laughs> God's, I think God's a madman. Yeah. The best part is you've named a bunch of different gods this whole yeah. podcast, and you're just one person, and you don't even know all of them. So why do we even have? Why is there a thousand different gods to choose from? <laughs> I I think it comes down to. Um, to archetypes gods when it comes to gods little g gods it's um it's it's <coughs> things we can aspire to um things that we want to be more like or things that we're afraid of couldn't you say um, something about the capital g gods too oh absolutely yeah um that, that's i say that because when i was in catholic school they they said that when you're when you're writing about our God, you capitalize the G. And when you're talking about other gods, you make sure it's a lowercase G. Because mm-hmm. we're that's better the than kind that. of shitty little, like, five-year-old stuff. Like, if you oh, ever yeah. noticed in, uh, I even saw it in my church in, like, 1990-whatever. It's that, like, if you notice, a lot of statues and pictures of the Mother Mary is standing on a crescent moon. Because the crescent moon is the is the figure, is the symbol of Islam. And because they, they think feet are unholy like you know how to curse something and so for a thousand years our virgin mary has been pictured standing on the most holy symbol of islam virgin mary which actually young lady, was interpreted that from young hebrew degree hussy no. young woman yeah standing on a moon wow that's that's a it's bit heavy. much it's it's dark well, it's jesus not is Christian. white too in case it's, you didn't know yeah right man I, I from was, man from israel from the middle east is i literally <laughs> My Kendall, my girlfriend, I love her very much. She was, we, we were exploring that that the religion thing, and she's like, you know, I found out a lot of my a lot of bands I listen to are Christian actually, and we went through, and it's like, <laughs> Paramore is overtly Christian, like Evanescence is overtly Christian. I didn't know either of those, and I, it's like there's so many, and she's like, yeah, listen to this song, and it's like. It, it's obviously like just a Jesus song, and it's like, oh no, and it's like they're every no, um, but yeah, it's. Um, I want to hear my theory about that. Yeah, it's just a way to widen the market. I was thinking the same Dang, thing. Christian, myself. Get out of here! I'm gonna be honest with you. I that's a joke. The whole time I was in that church the other day, I was like, I can sell this fucking glass here. So is it fucking, I can sell all this glass. I don't know. Like yeah. there's um, and same thing with like. I don't know. And that's a big reason why people join churches is economic networking. Um, 
at the end of the day, you have a hundred people that will help your business out that you can get business from that you know personally and can trust and not feel like you're getting dicked over because yeah, the priests and the watching. reverend think the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. If I was more of a sociopath and less empathetic towards others, <laughs> I could see myself being. I could run a. I could be the next Joel Osteen. You think honestly. so? Honestly, yeah. If you I was a psychopath, your eyes wide enough. Yeah. Jesus says. Yeah, <laughs> like Baker guy. Yeah. Oh man, why is I, Joel um, Osteen worth tens of millions of dollars? The irony. Yeah. Of being a man of God and being worth a lot and of that's, money. And that's the real thing that sticks in my craw and keeps me from ever giving money to a church, I think, in my entire life, is that every single pastor is living in a house that's much, much nicer than all of their congregants. Always, 100% of the time. I know I know a couple that aren't, but they're uh, not normal. Yeah, they're they're against the grain. Yes, they are. God bless them yes. and everything like that, and there are good Christians out there. God was a there. lowercase g. Yeah. I, but uh, why do you think you'd be a good... Religious leader. I'm, oh, just because I, 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 we kind of grazed over that. <laughs> well, because yeah, I've studied most of the religions, and I've studied a lot of, uh, I guess, cults and stuff like that. So I've it sounds like, like what you're saying, yeah, is you'd use education and intelligence to pull a veil over dumb people's eyes. Yeah, honestly, I think uh, by, that's not the right word. Uneducated, more ignorant people's eyes. Dumb is mean. I mean, I've named this guy twice now, but I'll do it a third time just because I think it's really important for intelligent people to read about him and see what the government what i don't know he wrote a book called mind war and it was essentially written as an explanation to stupid religious southern senators on what psychological warfare is and why it's important for the country and why it's the only way we're going to stop physical warfare um psychological warfare is the only way we're going to stop deaths from bombs and shit like that ever um and it goes over everything from like the Nazi like uh, mind control experiments to MK Ultra, uh, everything we've done ever uh, in gross detail, um, in all honesty. And it's fascinating. It's it's insane um, how much reading it it's it's affected our world today. Um, and then he's he wrote a second book called um, uh, Mind Star about when he was dying a few years ago like his thoughts on death and like what death is and from a medical neurological you know um uh <coughs> electro <coughs> electromagnetical thing like how to preserve consciousness after death and it's a fascinating book um and it's written by the former head of the NSA and it's he was a commander at NORAD and former <laughs> temple of satan the guy priest. you mentioned earlier yeah mm -hmm. um, electromagnetic Preserve, preserving of consciousness? Yeah, well, the idea is that, like, the shape of the the shape of your consciousness is this, this neural mesh network of, like, all the little... Like, if you were to just imagine all the electricity in your head as a shape, um, if you were to be able to you know, preserve that through consciousness of will as your, you know, as it leaves your body, um, and that's kind of what gets into the whole, like, dimethyltryptamine thing is that, like, a lot of people see di DMT as, like, the Wi-Fi emitter for the soul, for, like, if, if you're going to leave your body... That's the conduit through which you do it, and it gets into, like, quantum physics and shit I'm not educated enough to talk about. Um, but it's just a fascinating, like, what if? And honestly, between all the what ifs of, of God dying on a cross to save my soul and the idea of the stuff in my head that continuing to work possibly after death, one seems a lot more possible than the other. I don't know. The one with things working after death only seems possible because it's an action potential. It's mm -hmm. electrical charge, right? a positive and negative flow of electricity. However, maybe that's all consciousness is, is the actualization of positive and negative charges going across synapses, you know, and that's it. And it all comes down to and our that's perception. That's why it stops of, when you die. It comes to perception of time. Like um, when you dream, when you... Uh, when you have moments where dimethyltryptamine dumps from parts of your brain and your cerebrospinal fluid, you have moments of, of fluid time where a dream, an hour in a dream is really like 10 seconds in real life. Yeah. I mean, it happens what, with mushrooms I mean, there's and, like, and acid <laughs> there's all the time. Three right? or four, yeah, there's three or four movies where I feel like that's the story of like somebody dying and it's like, I mean, that's the story of uh, Vertigo. No. Um, damn, Jacob's Ladder. He's dead the whole time. 
Uh, sorry, to, sorry to spoil it. And the Sixth Sense. Sorry yeah. for those. Yeah, right. <laughs> Drugs, but that's that's any chemical change in the brain. It, it even happens yeah. with people who don't do drugs and aren't right. drinking, but they have, they're born with a chemical imbalance like schizophrenia. Yeah. And now things are going on that are distorting reality. It happens when you drink. Shoot, it happens when you fall in love and yeah. you're just hanging out with someone sober and you're like, where did six hours go by? You're just having a good time. Time is very elastic yeah. and it's relative to its own, your own self mm-hmm. and those around you. Do you ever have a good night with your friends? You're just having fun. Man, it's been eight hours. Where the time? It's 3 a.m. already. And you could be drunk, you could be sober, you could be high. It varies all the time. Yeah. Smoking weed makes time very strange. It makes yeah. it go places. It makes it get distorted. It makes it short. Oh, man, it's already so-and-so time. Or sometimes you're like, wow, it's midnight. I can't believe I've been high for 10 hours. Like, that's the time. Time is a weird one. It is so relative to the, each moment in which you're experiencing it. Like right now, do you know how long we've been? Don't look at anything. How long we've been doing this for? Two hours. Nope. Has it been longer? Yeah. Jesus. See? Yeah. And you're sober. You have a watch on you. There's phones nearby. There's, yeah. there's a clock. I see the time. Mm-hmm. You don't. I do that on purpose. Yeah. But, yeah, you don't even know how long it's been. No. It's uh, It's been a minute. But, <laughs> see? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that saying, too. A minute. Yeah. I haven't seen you in a minute. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, uh, it's life is strange, and it's beautiful, and it's scary, but it's... uh. It's worth going through all the effort. I don't know. There was a time in my life when I was really, uh, really down and really not enjoying life. And um, I feel like if there's a lot of people out there now between the pandemic and just isolation in general, I feel that way. And it's definitely worth pushing through the uh, the unpleasantness to find the value in life. Um, yeah, it's definitely worth uh, getting through the next day. Yeah. So, but yeah. <sighs> Talked about a lot of things, eh? We did. <laughs> we talked about some things I <laughs> didn't mean to get so deeply into, but I also uh, I'm I'm very uh, I'm a person that wears my heart on my sleeve in certain situations. I feel like this is an important one to do that in, absolutely, um, because it's like I said, art, and I'm I'm not a super nationalist by any means. I'm not like a extra hundred percent patriot, you know, aggro guy, but I really think that unless we Americans take more responsibility for each other's health, for each other's mental health, take more responsibility for our health infrastructure and fight the assholes that think that public health is not going to affect them at all because it does. Um, it's, we, we've got to make, we've got to try and make the world better. We got to try and make this place better. So it starts at home. Yeah, it does. starts in your house, personal change, yeah. your personal life, drink more water, drink more water, <laughs> your, your neighborhood, your town, yeah. your county, your state, your region. Yeah. The Midwest, America. It starts there. Cause like, we're not rich. I can't no. just change stuff. I'm not high up in politics. I, so I have to do again, as I mentioned earlier, like what is relative to me? Like my skill set is. I know a crap ton of people that are very religious, not religious, creative. Man, we got the real <laughs> We, we cross some wires here. here. Yeah. Crossing wires. <laughs> very creative. So I do things with that. You know, I'm I'm good at certain things, so I do it the best I can with those abilities, like putting on a festival to try to give people a place to sell art, play music, have camaraderie, grow, and raise money for people who need more than us. Because that's what I can do. That's what I can offer. I can't. I don't have a lot of money. Again, I didn't go to an Ivy League university. I'm not skull and bones. I'm not going to work my way up the political right, ladder. Right. So I don't do those things. Right. You know? I also hate the scrutiny you get when you're a politician. It's like, I want to be able to have this podcast and say what we say without that, any that's it. repercussions. I, that's becoming the target I mentioned earlier. It's scary. I don't want to become a target. I don't, no. want, I don't want people trying to take me down. Oh, yeah. for no reason. Just because you might have said one Just, thing right. they don't like. Or because what a lot of people don't like is that they might feel like I'm having a better time than them. Or yeah. <laughs> that like I'm actually like, this person's fucking happy and he's sinning and I need to make sure people know they can't do that. Yeah. And that's, it's the witch hunt. I'm, I'm afraid of the witch hunt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you're honest, transparent, a good person and you want good for people. I, I don't know who can truly get mad at that. They could try to pick it apart. Right. 
But that's why I like the podcast because if someone really didn't like something you said or I said, right. I'd be like, well, did you listen to all you know, yeah. two, three hours? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, <coughs> I don't know. If I did misspeak at any point, I I don't mean to disparage anyone for, you know, any kind of belief structure or any kind of, you know, personal bo- choice with their bodies or their sexuality. At the end of the day, I, I, I genuinely want people to be happy because happy Absolutely. people are easier to fucking deal with. I agree. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little harsh sometimes when it comes yeah. to religion, but what I yeah. really mean by it is like, Believe what you want. I'm yeah. for that. As long as it doesn't affect other people. And I, be kind about it. Be nice about it. Think think more about it too. Yeah. Like don't just take everything your priest, rabbi, reverend, whoever, your leader that you go to see, don't just take everything they say as the word of some God. Like take it in, think about it, process it, but like look further, read other books, read other holy scriptures, talk to other people of different faiths and learn more about it and Still have your beliefs, and that's fine. But don't be so close-minded about it. It's not safe. Yeah. It's dangerous for you and those around you. Yeah. At least try it, you know? Try to find God yourself before you submit to, you know, somebody else's opinion of what God is. Yeah. I think that's... Uh, if I ever do find a God, if I find, like, faith in something or, like, belief structure in anything other than myself, because I, I do believe in myself. I do... Um, I'm very proud of what I've accomplished. I'm very, even though I get down on myself and tear myself down and look for reasons to say I could have done things better, um, I'm happy with the things I've accomplished and I'm, and I've done it. I've done it. God didn't come down and and do the shit I've done. Um, he didn't, uh, whatever amount of blessing or opportunity I've received because of my family and because of like the situation I was born into, I'm grateful for, but Jesus... <laughs> Jesus didn't burn himself on my torch and have to deal with that. You know what I mean? Like, this is yeah, my you, accomplishment. you've accomplished a lot. Yeah. You know, facing your own adversity. Yeah. Whether it's the mental illness you spoke of, you know. Yeah. The alcoholism, people in your life, you know, your mom yeah. passing away. That's that's hard at that age. I can't even imagine. Yeah. It's difficult. And it's still something that bothers me. Um, but it's also something that... Uh, I don't know. It makes you grow. The the one thing I've heard of when people, the, the universal phrase I've heard of when um, people lose their parents and they're under like 25 or so is that it makes you grow up very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does. And to a certain extent, I grew up too quickly. Yeah. And now I'm like stressed out. Like I feel, sometimes I do feel like a 45, 50 year old man. My my level of like, oh, we got to get this done, honey. Like, <laughs> fuck. I, I'm, I need to loosen up. <laughs> I, um, I'm in an interracial, interracial relationship and I love my girlfriend very much and sometimes she's like dude you just got it you are so uptight I like <laughs> she imagines me as like this uptight like just <laughs> I, I just want to work all the time and it's like I really need to relax and I really need yeah. to enjoy being myself um, yeah and I think that everyone needs to work on enjoy i don't know some some people enjoy themselves too much (laughs) yes they do and need to work on enjoying other people (laughs) enjoy other people work a little harder play a little less it's my favorite word that really keeps me going is just balanced yeah you know um a little bit of this a little bit of that don't over don't take too big of a bite here don't take too small of a bite there have fun sometimes work real hard, you know, mm-hmm. go, go crazy and work hard for two, three weeks straight, but then have a weekend off and just have fun. Yeah. You know, work all really hard for 12 hours and then chill for an hour or two. Like I did that yesterday. I, I, I got a lot done and I made it a point to just work really hard for 12 hours straight from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I did that and it was a lot of stuff, but I got so much done. And then at seven, I just relaxed. I took a shower I watched the uh, I watched the show uh, Dave on Hulu, an episode. I don't do that often at all. I watched the NBA Western Conference final game. I don't do that all, a lot. Like, I just relaxed. Yeah. And it was just nice to, like, j- I used to love that stuff. I used yeah. to love playing basketball and watching. I used to love watching comedy shows. And I just stopped doing it because of being busy. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, like, do that. And it was fine. And I was like, I could sleep tonight. I went really hard for 12 hours working on stuff that I do myself. Like, that's okay. And you have to just find that balance and just be okay with it. You know, I woke up this morning really stressed about the next day of, like, getting stuff done and and things like DZ Fest. 
So I just like sat there and I, I sat in my bed and just like meditated for like six minutes. I set an alarm and I sat there. Did yeah. breathing exercises, closed my eyes, just laid there. Or not laid there, sat there for six minutes. And I felt so much better after that. Just taking that time to do that. I could have got up faster and worried more and said I did the opposite of getting stuff done. I got nothing done. Yeah. But in doing nothing, I gained so much. And that's that's that balance I keep trying to figure out. You know? Yeah. And I think it's... I'm envious. I wish I could do that as far as just sit down and, and through force of will, just quiet my brain. Um, and I think, you know, for a lot of people, they do need a focus. And that's why if you feel like you can't do that, if you feel like your brain just won't stop, um, definitely, like, look into, like, wushu or some sort of yoga is a huge thing for many people. Um, rope dart is what did it for me. It's what really inspired me. And I love doing it. And it's very fun. I'm probably going to go do that as soon as we finish here. So mm. and smoke and do that. And just love <laughs> being alive for fucking 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's very, it's very positive. Um, and I'm feeling generally good about, about all these things, despite the depression and despite all the yada yada, um, life is good. Yeah. Life is good. Yeah. Keep making it good. Keep making yeah. stuff, Max. This stuff's awesome. One thing I wanted to promote, um, Besides this was uh, the nailery. Um, that's uh, Kendall is my my partner. She is uh, she stopped being a librarian person to be a nail tech, a nail artist, and she does um, nail art. She's very talented. Um, we have a private uh, like little art studio in our place, and she takes clients. So if anyone's looking for super high end fancy nail art, the nailery uh, dot com or uh, just. Kendall's Nailery on Instagram. Um, but eventually, I, w I have big plans for us working together to make glass nails. I want to get a mold for so that we can shape them like press-ons and then facet them like jewels and make something that's not, that's a forever thing. Mm -hmm. uh, press-on nails are very disposable and very bad for the environment for the most part. So we're trying to make something that's forever. So, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Um, yeah. That's uh, cool. I, I'm, I'm very, um, <laughs> I feel like I catch a lot of shit on some of the Facebook groups because I do like doing experimental things and I like thinking with glass, uh, thinking outside of the box and the, the finger, the <laughs> glass fingernails are a weird thing. Glass martial arts weapons I don't think have ever been done ever. People have called me fucking crazy. How many groups <laughs> are you a part of? A couple, uh, just like two or three, but the ones that, like I said, the more you get into very specific genres or like, I feel like it's the equivalent of like, you went onto like a shoegaze Facebook group and they're, I don't know, I don't know, it's a very like, ex uh, I guess hardcore music, I don't know, whatever is an exclusive, very clicky subgenre of music you can think and be like, and people saying that's not real, insert genre here, that's that's what it's grindcore. That's not yeah. hardcore. Um, I think that's the biggest problem, though. Is you're on Facebook groups. I am. It's. It, I can't find yeah. glass blowing groups anywhere. You're, it's like borderline people hiding behind an avatar. It is. It is. It's like you should meet in person. Yeah. That's how you won't get berated with stupid comments. Yeah, but that's why I'm excited. I I would like to if things permit it probably maybe not at dz fest but sometime i'd like to start doing live glass blowing i think it's really inspiring for people to see it because it's a lot less insane than you think um so hopefully i'll be getting into uh you need like a power you do um uh, well uh, you don't necessarily need power um do you need power though I do because I use a kiln. I use what's essentially like a big easy bake oven that gets mm. to 1,500 degrees or 1,200 degrees and sits there and I put the glass in there and it's able to cool it down. But ah. the way the Japanese uh, did it and the way um, people have done it forever is they'll take uh, black carbon or like sand and they'll take the hot glass and stick it in the sand and that'll keep it hot long enough for it to anneal. Um, so yeah, there's ways to do it. There's old school ways. People have been doing it before they invent electricity for sure. Um, when it comes to like the borosilicate thing, you need propane, you need oxygen, and yeah, you need some kind of kiln. So yeah, you might be better off just bringing pieces. I I would really really like um uh oh if as far as like doing it live, I'm working on a power source, so we'll see. But um, I'm thinking I, uh, more safety. Safety, it's actually not nearly like um. There's a vapor that's created through the um 
combustion of oxygen and, and propane, but it's fairly like outdoors. It's not a big deal if as long as you have a fan um, and you're not like sitting there inhaling it. Yeah. Um, That's the problem is I can't the, provide any power. Yeah. For anybody. And the um, the only dangerous thing is when you're working with actual metals. One of the things that you can do that I haven't tried yet is called fuming, where you take a wire of gold or silver and you vaporize it in front of the flame and the glass catches it um, and it sticks to it. And that's much more intense, but um, it's also much more dangerous. Mm. Those fumes are super, super deadly. So that's Sounds why, bad. yeah. So that's why I just stick mostly to color. I don't do any fuming. Um, not that my setup is less safe to do so, but just because I've got enough. I've got enough projects to learn. I'm You're not, not there yet. I'm not quite. You'll, there you'll get yet. to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's been very fun, and uh, I would like to open. I, I would like to take. I would like to teach at some point. I really want to. Um, I've only been doing it for a year, and I don't have any formal training, so I feel like I need to take a what am I doing wrong class from a master at some point like that. Um, just get my bad habits out. But um, yeah, I'm moving along, and uh, I would like to start, uh, you know, taking um, just really simple like lessons and stuff like that. Um, it's my I say dream, but it's 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 a big goal of mine to like involve more people with the glass because there are a few people have hit me up that are like, please, I want to do this. Like this is what I want to do. Like, and there's no opportunities in Chicago. That's in the South Side, especially. That's why I went out of the way to do all this because otherwise I couldn't. There's nowhere around here that teaches boro. The only people, the only places that teach lamp working are doing that soft glass. That like you know old lady bead glass, which is fine. It's really cool. I'd like to get into it myself, but this kind of thing, this kind of level of quality of, um, style and strength is, uh, I'm the only one doing it within 15, 20 miles of where I am. I think that I know of that, you know, of, yeah. that I know of, I'd love to meet more people. I'd love to start like a glass blowing like collective yeah. in Chicago. That's how like the big guys on the West coast do it. They just got eight OGs in a room putting together hundred thousand dollar pieces of glass. Um, yeah, Dan Belzerian bought, um, the AK series that, uh, there's this glass studio. It's like multi-generation people working there, uh, the Mickelson family, but they put together these AK 47s that are life size and they're incredibly detailed and gilded and like multiple functional pieces. And you like do dabs out of it and then blow the smoke through it and it comes out. Oh it's insane. And they sold for like between 30 and $50,000 each. He bought all of them. Of course he did. Because he's an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. yeah. he's a fucking asshole. But I'll sell Dan, Dan Belzerian worth $100,000 of glass someday. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Most people like to make money. So. <laughs> right, right. Um, but that's uh, – and I'm not necessarily looking to make that – that's not my goal with this art. Um, but I feel like for people, like if my, the ghost of my grandfather visits me and he's like, why are you fucking doing this? Why aren't you making money? <laughs> you know? It's like, grandpa, I'm going to make fucking money off it. It's okay. Grandpa, I'm doing what, I'm, what I love. <laughs> yeah, it's given me a reason to live. I mean, yeah. I have a lot of other reasons to live, but this is a really cute or a really fun. It's a beautiful one. I like making beautiful things in the world. You're an artist. Yeah. You want to express yourself. I yeah. get it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's It's not always about Money, money is like a byproduct. Yeah, it, it is a nice thing to sustain yourself, but yeah. at your core, it's about expressing yourself, being happy. You and know? it's it's to a certain degree. Um, I feel like some people will say, "Well, that's sad that you need validation." But I love validation. I really like being. I, I need validation. Sorry, everybody loves and it selling, in some way. Selling an eighty dollar bowl is is. It's nice that yeah. someone's really happy with, and it's and they get to get high valuable. out of it often, right? And and that's the thing I haven't even like. Uh, sometimes I forget, like, oh yeah, I'm I'm making bowls here. I'm making things for people to use for people that something at 15 I would have gone nuts, so insane over never imagine. And that's the thing, like I I really need to stop and be grateful more because, what like I got kicked out of. I got pick, kicked out of school for smoking weed at, fit, at like 17 or 16 or whatever the fuck. And I make glass. I work at a dispensary. A 16-year-old me would have murdered someone to have my life. Yeah. For real. Yeah. And I can't believe that I, I get depressed <laughs> at times. Like, it's, 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 it's good to stay focused or remember. Sometimes it is good to remember the past and compare it because... 
a lot of the time it's better. Yeah. So, no, yeah. It, I, yeah. I, I feel the same way. 16 year old me would be like, what? You're talking about smoking weed and taking mushrooms, <laughs> but then you're doing all this stuff. Like, wait, I thought those things can't be hand in hand. It's like, no, they can. It's, it's a balance. Like you can't do too much of any type of drug. And the, you know? the entire, I think breaking stereotypes is how you're going to fix things with, with inner, inner, inner group people, like yeah. with racists and with misogynists and with bigots. It's like, you really need to treat them. I, I hate to say it, but the Christian, uh, to a certain extent, when people get across the line of violence, that changes things. But up until that point, if people are being bigots or whatever, just treat them, treat them nice. They're, they're sick. Kill them they're with fucking, kindness. Yeah, you really do. Always. Um, it works. I hate to... Uh, Break it to you, people. I've been there. It, uh, honest, it works. It, honestly, if the only thing I get out of going to this mega church or getting involved in Christianity is that they see like, oh, well, that guy who said he was, he was a Satanist, but he was nice. He was, I guess they're not all bad. I guess uh, that's that's a, a huge success. Yeah. That is a huge success. <sighs> yeah. That's funny. <laughs> I think that's a good but, spot to end it. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and talking about mega church, he was a good guy. Do you want to push or promote any websites or any place where people can find you on social media for anything you do? Max Duffy Glass on Instagram is the best way to get a hold of me right now and where I post the most. Um, a TikTok of the same name is where I post everything I for a lot. If you're on TikTok primarily, um, DuffyDrop.com is where you can get all my clothing. You can see my designs. Um, I've got swimwear and skater dresses. That's the huge thing right now. Um, the skater dresses are really fun. Um, if you see the website, um, my girlfriend Kendall, she's there. She, she's modeled them. Um, and they come up to, uh, I think the dresses come up to three X. We have, uh, uh, leggings and shorts and stuff up to five X. So we're like all sizes. And I'm also looking to still change things up. So if there's anyone in the Chicagoland area that, does apparel or does like sewing or does seem interesting that's looking into looking into make something like this that wants to make rave clothing for plus size women please contact me because i would love to make everything in-house i would love to make everything made in chicago that's what i want but all the printers in chicago suck or they're only trying to deal with nike and stuff like that so um yeah when it comes to the glass max duffy glass on instagram i'm trying to get uh my website rebuilt, so right now it doesn't have any products on there. But um, yeah, I uh, I'm excited. I think I'm going to be doing some events coming up. But please follow my Instagram for you know uh, confirmations on that. And yeah, if you're looking for uh, the flow art stuff, I uh, uh, Frank at Frank Hatzis is the OG at uh, the Rope Rope Dart Academy. I really like that place, and uh, they're good folks. Um, it's all American stuff, and yeah. Besides that, um, the nailery.com, the nail stuff um, that we do together, and it's good. So I think that's it. I'm not sure. I'm like, I'm going to forget something. That was a lot of stuff. You plugged I a do lot. A lot. And see, that's when I, if I sit down and people ask me what I do, and like, what, what do I do for fun? And in 30 seconds, I list all that. They're like, this guy's just lying. He's just making <laughs> shit up. He's just, and I also do, uh, oh, and I also do kung fu. <laughs> it's like, Jesus, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. With life? Hey, it's okay. You'll, you, the right. more you balance, the more you can start to hone in on what you really love. Yeah. So cool, yeah. man. Thank you for coming here, Max. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Me. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty and sharing everything. It was wonderful. I hope you start to have this blossom more and get, and find people who want to get it. It's pretty wild stuff. I love it. It's very cool. Very eclectic. The colors, I'm a big fan of the shapes, the colors, the glass. It's really cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. So thanks for being here, and we'll be talking soon. Hopefully, we'll see you at a DZ Fest selling some glass. Amen. All right. <laughs> Amen. All right. Bye.